Good afternoon and evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Aspen Virtual Think Tank. This tonight is session two, focusing on spinal cord stimulation and then having our first Shark Tank sessions. We will begin the webinar momentarily to allow a few more people time to log on. Again, thank you for joining us. We will start the webinar promptly in one minute. Again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Aspen Virtual Think Tank. We will begin the webinar shortly to, and to allow a few more people time to log on. Tonight will be session two, focusing on spinal cord stimulation, followed by our first Shark Tank session. We are so glad you've been able to join us tonight and we will start promptly at 6.02. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the Aspen Virtual Think Tank, session two, focusing on spinal cord stimulation. Gentlemen, Dr. Deer and Dr. Syed, please take it away. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're really excited to welcome everyone for uh, session two uh, of our uh, second annual uh, Aspen Think Tank, our first virtual offering. Uh, and again today, because of such innovation uh, and explosion in the growth, we've uh, dedicated two days to spinal cord stimulation. So this will be session two, uh, and Tim is going to run you through uh, a brief summary of today's exciting agenda. Tim, I hope you're well, doing okay for that birthday. You doing okay for that birthday? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well, man. Okay. Thank All you. Right. It's been a, been a good week so far. So I know many of you joined us last night. Having over 400 people register for the Think Tank, we, we think that's very exciting. Uh, as we go into our annual meeting next month, which will be CMA accredited, I think to have this type of response for the Think Tank, which is really more of a time, as I said last night, for us to share ideas. And so, you know, that really is in the spirit of what we came to do, and that means we're trying to improve the field. So we're hearing from different collaborating companies about their ideas, and then I think we can, as physicians, as scientists, as people in the industry, we can take all those ideas and say, you know, what's best for our patients and maybe modify those and continue to improve. That's the whole purpose of the think tank. So here's our agenda, as you can see in our slide. In a moment, uh, God will introduce uh, Kazra Almodalfan, uh, who's on our executive board, to talk about some advances in uh, 10 kilohertz uh, spinal cord stimulation, and along with uh, his colleagues, Dr. Tate and Dr. Gray. Then we'll have Boston Scientific uh, offer some of their newest uh, uh, really options in the care of uh, patients. Uh, Dr. Marshall Better, who's a emeritus board member of our society, along with Dr. Lou Rosso and Dr. Jennifer Lee, will be talking about some of those advances, followed by Saluda Medical, a, a company that's been doing some great research, uh, recently published uh, in one of the most impactful journals in the space, Lan Lancet Neurology, their most recent uh, prospective randomized study, which uh, I had the honor to be part of. And we're going to have Dr. Peter Statz, Dr. Sean Lee, and Dr. My great, great friend, Dr. Mark Russo from Australia, uh, who did the Avalon study, which preempted uh, the U.S. study. And then we're going to do a Shark Tank. Uh, for those of you who watch Shark Tank, uh, Dawa likes to think of himself as Mark Cuban. I'm not sure that's accurate, but uh, we're going to have Dr. Amos Soin, who is a, a dear friend from Ohio. Uh, he's going to talk about some things he's doing and give us his, his ideas. And then uh, we'll be looking at Neuralace, uh, another kind of something new to many of you. Uh, Dr. Shukla, uh, the CEO of that company. And remember, this has been recorded, so a lot of our members will watch this a little later. So we, we feel this will reach several hundred people uh, over the next uh, few weeks. So I think that's very important. Dal, would you want to introduce the first session, my friend? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I may or may not be Cuban, but you definitely are Mr. Wonderful uh, from Shark Tank, that's <laughs> for sure. So, um, so I'd I'm like to really remember, care, but... <laughs> for sure. Uh, I'd like to introduce. Uh, you know, the uh, Vice President of Clinical Affairs for ASPN, he's done a fantastic job in the space of spinal cord stimulation, uh, one of the leading researchers and clinicians of our space, uh, Dr. Kazar Emmer-Delfin. Uh, the floor is yours, my friend. 
Thank you so much, Dawood. Thank you so much, Tim. Happy birthday to Tim. It's a pleasure to be with all of you and launch the second session of Aspen's virtual think tank talking about spinal cord stimulation. Uh, I, I have the pleasure of starting the Nevro session of the think tank, and we're gonna talk about the new indications and new advancements in 10,000 hertz spinal cord stimulation. Next slide, please. My name is Cass Hammer Dolphin. I'm a pain management physician in Northern California. I'm the director of medical research for uh, IPM Medical Group, which has 20 offices and over 75 providers in the state of California. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Gore uh, from University of Arkansas. He's going to share some really exciting data from uh, the Senza PDN study, which is the largest randomized control trial to date about um, uh, with spinal cord stimulation for painful diabetic neuropathy. Last but not least, we have Dr. Jordan Tate from Alliance Pain Center, and she's going to uh, share with us some of the data from a non, uh, from a uh, pilot study we did on non-surgical refractory back pain, which has led to a, a large randomized controlled trial trial for that indication as well. I'm going to share with you some of the latest technological advances in hardware and software with uh, Nevro. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about how the Nevro platform has moved uh, beyond the HFN therapy, which has always been the cornerstone of what they do, to a far more versatile programming platform. Next slide, please. So the Omnia system is the latest offering from Nevro. The Omnia system can deliver any frequency between 2000 hertz and 10,000 hertz, which is also the case for all the other IPGs ever developed by Nevro. But this platform makes it possible for every single patient to be able to receive any frequency and just about any waveform available on the market. Aside from that, from its launch, it has full body MRI conditional approval from the FDA, and it's exclusively up upgradable to any future frequency and waveform, which we find to be useful uh, with scientific research. This device is upgradable permanently, meaning that it doesn't just get uh, upgraded for a month or two for patients to be able to test it out and then they have to get a replacement for their IPGs, which is actually the case with other upgradable devices on the market. If there is new frequencies, if there are new waveforms to be used, then this device can be upgraded for the patient once and for all. The programmer allows for simple delivery of a lot of different programs to the patients in a very transparent manner. And for the first time ever for the Nevro platform, the physician can actually be involved in the programming of the patients with this user-friendly platform, which we'll talk about in more detail in just a couple of minutes. So it also includes some intuitive hardware, the hardware um, accessories that the patients can use, including a charger and a remote control. Next slide, please. So why Omnia? Well, Omnia actually reflects Nevro's commitment to helping the patients achieve the best possible outcomes. Omnia is designed and developed based on feedback from physicians and advisors just like ourselves who use the Nevro devices for HFN therapy on a regular basis. We had all had fantastic success with HFN, but we wanted to be able to use this device far beyond HFN therapy as well. So the, this device actually provides a, a very versatile platform that can not only provide the patients with HFN therapy, but it can do low frequency, it can do burst waveforms, or any frequency in between. And for the first time ever, you don't have to choose between HFN therapy or low frequency or burst. You can actually combine various frequencies and waveforms in frequency pairing programs in order to be able to augment the patient's pain control and potentially address more complex pain signals as well. Uh, next slide, please. So next click. We know from uh, peer-reviewed published literature the kind of robust responder rates we can get with HFN therapy in the right end of this spectrum. You can see how from the Senza RCT and the Senza European studies, we were able to achieve far better responder rates than we had ever seen with anything else. On the left on the end of the spectrum, next slide. We also have data from traditional or low frequency spinal cord stimulation. In the recent past, next slide, we've seen some uh, published peer reviewed evidence with other frequencies and waveforms as well. As you can see, all of those get clumped below 1200 hertz at the left end of the spectrum. Next slide. 
But for the first time ever, the Omnia platform can not only deliver all the low frequencies and the other waveforms in the left end of the spectrum, but it can also provide the patients with HFM therapy with an, at the right end of the spectrum and combine all of them for hopefully better um, uh, optimized therapy for our patients. Next slide. So from the work of a lot of neuroscientists around the world, uh, we now know that HF10 therapy works with a different type of mechanism of action. There's actually direct neural inhibition that happens at 10,000 hertz, that, that which may be the reason why we see the kind of uh, superior outcomes that we see with HF10 therapy. We don't see those, uh, those types of outcomes at 1,000 hertz or 5,000 hertz. In fact, the neuroscientific research was just recently published. Next slide in the Journal of Neuroscience, um, and it's available to all of you to read. Next click. But the whole idea behind spinal cord stimulation is in fact, what we're trying to do is to activate the inhibitory neurons without activating the excitatory neurons. If we can activate the inhibitory neurons to a certain extent without exciting the excitatory neurons, then we can potentially inhibit the pain signal from going to the brain. Next slide. In this particular publication, this is in fact what the neuroscientists did. At 1000 Hertz, there was some activation of the inhibitory neurons without a lot of activation of the excitatory neurons. It was a step in the right direction. Similar outcomes were seen at 5000 Hertz. And it wasn't until 10,000 Hertz that we saw a discernible difference between the free good, between activating the inhibitory neurons uh, without activating the excitatory neurons, which may be the reason why we see the kind of outcomes that we see with 10,000 hertz and HF10 therapy. Next slide. In fact, this has also been studied in, uh, in humans. Dr. Alton and Alcazi and the investigators, along with him, published a pilot paper, a feasibility paper, um, in 2017, looking at various frequencies in blinded patients. They took about 24 patients with low back pain with an average VAS score of 7.8, and they exposed them to sham to 1,000 hertz, 3,000 hertz, and 5,000 hertz. And what they were able to show, first and foremost, was that placebo is a very powerful therapeutic effect. You know, the patient's vascular was reduced down to about a 4.8 at about 1200 hertz. There, was, there wasn't a big difference between sham and, and uh, the outcomes they saw at 1200 hertz. You know, the vascular was reduced to about 4.5. At 3000 hertz, the vascular was about 4.6. And it wasn't until about 6000 hertz or 5800 hertz to be exact that they were able to see a significant reduction in the VAS scores. So as you can see, the trend of the VAS score so as the increase lower with increasing the frequency, it may be the reason why we saw the kind of outcomes that we saw in the Senza RCT and the Senza European study with VAS scores of 2.4. Next slide, please. So can we potentially augment the patient's pain control or address more complex pain with frequency pairing. Now that we can combine HFN therapy with burst, now that we can combine HFN therapy with low frequency, could we potentially use this platform to actually get better pain outcomes in our patient population? And that's the question that everyone has. Next slide. On the left on this spectrum, we know that HFN therapy works with direct neural inhibition. So any strategy such as continuous HFN therapy or pulse dosing causes direct neural inhibition and gives pain relief to the patients in that manner. At the right end of the spectrum, we have burst and low frequency that can have indirect neural inhibition by affecting the A beta fibers. So what if we combine these two waveforms and frequencies? Could we potentially have better outcomes for our patient population? Next slide, please. This is an example of how traditional SCS can be frequency paired with HFN therapy. These patients do feel paresthesias. So if they feel like they wanna get paresthesias, they can potentially choose this program and not only get the augmented pain control from HFN, but also get the paresthesias if they want it. Next slide. The burst waveform can also be combined with HFN therapy in a program that never calls for 10 k um, and uh, the patients can potentially get the benefit of the mechanism of action of first, as well as the benefit of mechanism of action for HFN therapy. Next. So 
just like everything else, Nevro puts evidence first. And before they brought these frequencies and frequency pairing to market, they did a feasibility study in Australia. They interviewed about 500 patients and found about 5% of the patients who were non-responders or, or had less than 50% pain control. And uh, it was 26 patients and they brought them out and enrolled them in a study in order for them to test frequency pairing or first 10K. The responder rate was 17% and the responder rate is defined as 50% or more pain relief at the baseline of the study. And at about two months, the responder rate had increased to an impressive 60% in this patient population. Next slide. Aside from that, a significant portion of the patients had improvement in their sleep. Next. 74% of the patients had improvement in their function. Next. And 38% were actually able to reduce their opioid uh, consumption, which is music to my ears. This is a preliminary study. It was very, very promising, but we can potentially study this in the future to be able to see if we can really do better with frequency pairing for, with our patient population and actually use commercial data from the NevroCloud, which we'll talk about in just a second, to see if frequency pairing is a better strategy for our patients in the future. When NEVRO launched in 2015 here in the United States, a lot of the investigators and a lot of the, the, the uh, consumers, physicians, neuromodulators out there talked about the fact that NEVRO is not really quite transparent about their programming, which wasn't really true. You know, NEVRO was incredibly transparent from the very beginning, but they wanted to, and they heard this, and they wanted to address this with the next platform. So the Omnia platform is actually one of the most transparent platforms on the market in terms of programming. As you can see, this is the programming interface and the physician himself or herself can get involved in programming the patient along with the representative based on their own clinical experience and their fund of knowledge of the patient. The HFN continues to be the cornerstone of any therapy we do with Nevro. And this is the reason why it has the big blue oval button for HFN right in the middle. But other strategies such as pulse dosing, frequency pairing, burst 10K, and traditional low frequency spinal cord stimulation is also available on the same platform. You can see the uh, P tabs on top, there's five programs to choose from. So every uh, patient can potentially be programmed with five different complex programs for them to be able to use at home. Next slide. Let's not forget that this is the only device on the market with HF10 therapy that has no restrictions with driving based on FDA labeling. It is paresthesia free, so the patients don't have any positional effect or annoying tingling if they don't want it. There's uh, no sleep restrictions, and, there's, and this is by far one of the most convenient uh, charging platforms on the market. We actually studied this in the Sense RCT in both the arms of the study, and I had the honor of presenting the data at NAS just a few years ago and the NEVRO arm of the study, had the patients had far more satisfaction with the charging cadence. Um, and there's also full body MRI conditional approval from the get-go with this platform as well. Next slide. In my opinion, the most powerful part of NEVRO's platform is the NEVRO cloud. We've always tried to collect data on our own patient population through registries and whatnot. But for the first time ever, a company is putting their money where their mouth is, and they're collecting data on their own commercial patients, not just for a month or two or three months, but as long as the patient is willing to submit data back to the company. That data is available to every single implanting physician who uses Nevro on a regular basis, so they can look at the outcomes of their own patients in a short-term or a long-term basis and compare their outcomes with other physicians globally um, within the Nevro cloud database uh, to, in order to be able to see whether they can do better with their patient selection or not. This is by far one of the most powerful tools we have in our arsenal in order for us to know how we're doing with our patient population with neurostimulation. Next slide. So in summary, Omnia was developed based on feedback from physicians and investigators and advisors, and it's by far the most transparent the most user-friendly, and certainly the most versatile platform ever come to market uh, with spinal cord stimulation. It can do any frequency from 10,000 hertz all the way down to two hertz with various different programming platforms. And the early data for the frequency pairing is really promising. 
And I'm personally looking forward to more scientific evidence in using frequency pairing in the future. With that, I'd like to turn the table over to Dr. Jonathan Gore, who's going to go through the Senza PDN uh, randomized control trial data that we have so far. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the introduction. I'd also really like to thank uh, the leadership of Aspen, Tim and Dawood, for putting on this week of programming. Uh, I really think it's essential for us as a field to have robust discussions of new research and technology in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, and with that, I have the honor and the privilege to discuss what I believe is a really, is a very impactful multi-center clinical trial, which I was excited to be a part of. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the meat and potatoes of the study and really discuss the methods and results for all of you. We recruited a number of patients with painful diabetic neuropathy of the lower extremities with pain scores greater than five, A1C less than 10, and BMI less than 45. And after independent medical monitors reviewed the subjects for inclusion and exclusion criteria, we randomized 216 subjects into one of two arms, either conventional medical management or conventional medical management plus 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation. All patients in the 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation arm underwent percutaneous trial as a standard of care, and patients were required to have 50% relief to qualify for implant. At three months, we assessed multiple outcomes, including pain improvement, quality of life, and neurologic function, which was measured by a standardized neurologic exam, which included monofilament testing and pinprick. Next slide. So this is our subject disposition slide. I'm gonna spend a little time here kind of walking through the study. We had 430 patients assessed for eligibility by our medical monitors. 216 met criteria and were randomized to either medical management or 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation. 103 were randomized to the medical management arm. And at three months, 96 of those patients were assessed for our primary endpoints. 113 were randomized to 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation. 104 of those patients underwent a percutaneous trial, 90 were, 90 were implanted, and 88 were followed up at three months for our primary endpoints. And I'll, I'll discuss kind of our adverse events in a couple of slides. Uh, there were two analysis. Uh, there was an intention to treat analysis, including all the randomized patients. And there was also a per protocol population analysis, which includes those that were assessed at three months. Next slide. Next slide. So here's our table one slide or our base, baseline characteristics. And as you can see, our patients were well randomized. Next slide. And here's our adverse event slide. I really wanna make an important point here. We had two adverse events that were rated as serious adverse events and post, both were related to infection. Uh, one resolved with an IMB, IND and antibiotics and one was a wound dehiscence which resulted in device exploitation. But one question that I think all the investigators had was what will the infection rate be in this population? And we had a 1.8% infection rate, which is below the rates published in the literature on the right-hand column. Next slide. And here's our results slide of our per protocol analysis. Our endpoint is patients with greater than 50% pain relief without worsening neurologic deficit. Next slide. So 5% of our control group achieved this versus 86% of our 10 kilohertz spinal cord simulation group. And of note, our intention to treat analysis was consistent with our per population analysis with strong significance between groups. Next slide. So our conclusion, 10 kilohertz spinal cord simulation is a potential therapy for patients with painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And I would say anecdotally, it's been exceedingly rewarding to talk to patients whose only option was a gabapentinoid or a TCA. And we all know that these medications don't work for a majority of our patients. But to know in the future that 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation may be a potential solution to improve these outcomes is extremely exciting. Um, all of our co-investigators are listed on the right, and we are continuing to follow these patients out to 24 months. And we have a number of outcomes, including economic outcomes and pain medication usage that we'll be measuring. Next slide. And with that, I'll introduce my colleague, Dr. Tate, to discuss non-surgical low back pain. Thank you, Jonathan. 
wonderful overview of PDN. I'm gonna pivot now and talk about non-surgical refractory back pain or NSRBP. As we all know, as pain physicians and neurosurgeons, chronic low back pain is a number one cause of disability in the United States. Many patients that we treat have chronic low back pain from failed back surgery syndromes. However, a lot of our patients are not surgical candidates, have never had surgery, um, and or have been told that they don't have the correct spinal anatomy for surgery or have other medical conditions that preclude surgical options. In these patients, of course, we treat them with conventional medical management or CMM. Many of these patients will undergo procedures such as epidurals, other spinal injections, radiofrequency ablations, and perhaps be met with, with limited relief. Patients may be relegated to chronic use of opioid therapy or other medication management. For these patients, we're really seeking other options. We're looking for a level one evidence, and right now it just doesn't exist. There have been many wonderful case reports, poster presentations, case series, which show that spinal cord stimulation can be a treatment for non-surgical refractory back pain, but we'd really like to build the evidence. Many of you have read from Dr. Adnan al -Kayazi. Um, his published report in pain medicine came out in 2018, a three-year pilot study. Um, what he did out of the UK was take patients who had chronic low back pain. He had them eval evaluated and ruled out for surgical options. If these patients had axial back pain that was significantly more than their leg pain, present for more than six months with a VAS greater or equal than five, these patients were potential candidates for spinal cord stimulation. Utilizing HF10 therapy and undergoing a 10 to 14 day temporary trial, Dr. al Kaizi enrolled 21 patients. 20 of these patients achieved the benchmark 50% pain relief and were then eligible to move on to permanent implant. Next slide. He had wonderful results with these patients. On the left, we see the responder rates, again, a 50% uh, reduction in pain. At 12 months, 90% of the patients achieved this benchmark, and this was sustained out to 36 months, uh, reduced down to 80% overall. Um, on the right, we see the chart in blue that shows our VAS score for our chronic low back pain. At baseline, we were looking at about an 8.4, this was dramatically reduced at three months and then carried out, uh, plateaued down to 36 months with a VAS on average of 0 0.1. The gray line shows our leg pain, which of course was significantly less as this was an axial low back pain study. Dr. al had the wherewithal to monitor the patient's opioids and as such saw a wonderful reduction um, in the opioid usage as well as in the MMEs. At baseline, 90%, a 19 out of 20 of the patients were taking um, and utilizing chronic opioid therapy. Um, at the end of 36 months, there was only two out of the 17, which was 12%, who were continuing to utilize opioid therapy. A significant reduction in utilization of that medication. Additional outcomes that were obtained at 36 months, we're looking at satisfaction scores, which uh, were rated at 85%. 100% of patients said they would recommend HF10 therapy for the treatment of chronic low back pain. And ODI scores showed a 33-point reduction in the average ODI. Next. So this landmark study um, shows early promising results and has led to the initiation of a large-scale randomized control trial called the Senza NSRBP. Next slide. So the randomized control trial design has been undertaken, and the objective is to compare clinical and cost effectiveness of HF10 therapy, combining that with conventional medical management and comparing that versus conventional medical management alone. This was powered to be a large study with an N of 216 and to take approximately a year. The outcomes primary were responder rate, again, using that 50% benchmark in pain relief. Secondary, looking at ODI, overall pain relief and impression of change, quality of life improvement factors, and utilization in opioid. 
Um, a tertiary outcome was healthcare utilization to look at the cost effectiveness of HF10 therapy. Next slide. The enrollment started back in September of 2018, and as of Q1 of this year, uh, the enrollment was completed. The, um, the power analysis showed that uh, the enrollment uh, was ready to stop, um, indicating that they had achieved their primary um, objective by the end of trial. The expectation is to announce these results, the three-month primary endpoint data at 2021 NANS, um, and the um, intention, of course, is to set the stage for um, allowing HF10 therapy to be considered in the algorithm and treatment for non-surgical refractory back pain, as well as getting our commercial payers on board with including HF10 therapy and spinal cord stimulation um, in this treatment module. Next slide. Thank you. I think we'll send it back to Kat. Jordan, that was amazing. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Gore. You did a phenomenal job as well. I think we're all looking forward to getting together in person uh, for us to be able to see this data uh, at NANS. And hopefully by that time, the world will be safe for us to be able to do that. And let's not forget, we're hoping to be able to see the 12-month data from the PDN study as well. I thank you. I thank all of you guys for the, for presenting the way you did, and I, I want to thank the audience and Dr. Deer and Dr. Syed for this opportunity. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have at this point. We have some questions for you, Cass. Great job, all three of you. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to actually I'm going to ask Jonathan a question, and I think uh, Dalwood has a question for Cass, and then I have a question for Jordan. So, Jonathan, the first question goes to you. I'm, I'm going to ask you to predict the future a little bit. Uh, your study on diabetic neuropathy was a great study. You know, I know you and Erica, your colleague there uh, in Arkansas, uh, Dr. Peterson, who's on our board, uh, along with your colleagues, did great work there. Uh, what can we do, and this is a, I assume is a tough question for you to answer in 30 seconds or, or so, but what can we do to make uh, uh, neuromodulation uh, a go-to option for peripheral neuropathy? Because I think it works quite well. And you showed that in your study. What can we do to make it mainstream? I think we really have to disseminate the evidence. Um, you know, we have to make sure that while I think it's great that we are, you know, discussing this trial and discussing the evidence, I think we have to make sure that our colleagues that are in family medicine, that are in endocrinology, that are in neurology, uh, really understand this evidence also. And I, so I think the onus is on us. And I, I think that's not that's not just here, but that's with all neuromodulation, that we have to really make sure that the other fields understand how impactful it can be for our patients. And I think we, we're we doing a good job building the evidence to make that argument. That's a fantastic great, great, answer. Great answer, I love that answer. Kaz, I have a question for you since you know, you've know you been involved with uh, 10 kilohertz stimulation since the Senza RCT, and you probably have patients that are out the longest out of you know anyone uh, in the country besides some of the other investigators. And now that we've kind of looked at Nevro's kind of opening up the programming capabilities you know and historically when we did this it was all anatomical have you changed your practice uh, moving forward with now in the back of your mind thinking about you know frequency pairing using high frequency low frequency things that are typically uh, anatomically mapped how has your practice changed with you know this new platform from nevro uh, that's an excellent question though with and uh, frankly i haven't changed my practice at all i'm a big believer in hfn therapy i i still have all my patients from the Senzo RCT, and the first one was actually implanted on August 12, 2012. So we are out almost eight years with my first patient and just about all the patients that I enrolled in that study. And every single one of those patients continues to get excellent pain relief from their devices. I haven't had a single explant from that patient population whatsoever. So I'm a believer in that therapy and I continue to believe that anatomical lead placement is really the right thing to do for HFN therapy with the kind of patient selection of that. Having said that, I'm paying a very small amount of attention to the side of the pain for the patients as well. So if somebody has predominant leg pain, for example, along with their back pain, I make sure that at least uh, one of the leads is to the left of the anatomical midline, just in case I need to be able to address that in the future for some, for some reason outside of HFN therapy. But I'm not doing any paresthesia mapping in the operating room at all. So before we go to the next session, I, I do want to ask uh, 
Dr. Tate, a question. Uh, Jordan, um, you know, we have almost 500 people now registered for this event tonight. And, and a lot of those people heard your presentation on the, the non-surgical back patient. And, and I think it's so important. I had one of these patients today, actually. Um, and Adnan Alkazi is a, a dear friend uh, and, and, you know, certainly did some good work. But what currently, well, we're building evidence and your study is quite helpful, but as we build evidence, uh, what can we do currently to um, make medical necessity for these patients who've seen a surgeon or two and they say, we can't do surgery to help you. They have severe back and leg pain and we know stimulation might really uh, offer a good option for them. What, what's your strategy to try to get approval to do a stimulation trial on those folks? So when I'm doing any sort of appeals or denials, I like to be prepared. Um, and one thing I will always remind the person on the other end is that spinal cord stimulation therapy is an on-label indication for refractory pain of the trunk. Um, it, th whether they you know, have it in their mind that it needs to be failed back surgery syndrome or it needs to be leg pain, um, you know, they're, they're working with some antiquated notions of what we are dealing with in chronic pain. Uh, number two is, as a, as a pain physician, you know, my opinion only carries so much weight with these peer-to-peer um, -peer sometimes. And so having the patient usually visit and obtain a letter from one or even two uh, neurosurgeons who will dictate that this patient is not now or in the near future deemed to be a surgical candidate. Um, and then delineating, you know, to this um, appeals uh, physician or um, whoever's on the other end, that you know this patient is really out of options here we have tried and failed all of these conservative measures this patient is now going to be relegated to a lifetime of chronic opioid therapy if we don't uh, open up the doors for their options um, usually those three factors seem to make a make a big difference no, I think that's great insight, and it's very similar to what I do, and I've had some success, so I think we're getting there, and, and certainly I think uh, I love what you said, that you call and, and get involved in the appeal yourself, and I think that's so critical that physicians take the time to do that, because that's a very important thing, and you have the knowledge of your review of the literature, which is on your side, so thank you all three so much. I think this was an amazing session, uh, and thank again, you. I think it's very beneficial uh, as evidence-based, which I love, so uh, you guys have a great night, and thanks so much for doing this. Kaz, we'll see you. I hope we see you in January. I'm not optimistic that January will happen because of <laughs> cool. COVID, but I hope we do. Gosh, I want to go somewhere so yeah. bad. So, I'm a, I'm a glass so. half full guy. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I think I'll see you. I may see you yeah, next July, I'm yeah. afraid, but uh, I, hope, I hope to be yeah. earlier. So, so um, our next session, I just want to mention a, a few things about the next session, then give it over to Dalwood to introduce the session. But, um, you know, Dr. Jennifer Lee, Dr. Marshall Better, and Dr. Lou Rosso, uh, certainly three people that are really doing great things in the field. We're very honored to have them tonight to discuss uh, the, the next topic. So, Dalwood, I'll give it to you to introduce the topic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think uh, Boston Scientific uh, has really, I think, uh, up their game over the last, you know, 24 months and um, some of the advancements they've done. I've been really impressed with some of the literature and data they've produced. And I've been the most impressed by people that I really know and respect in the field and the clinical outcomes that they're getting with their patients. So someone who's, you know, uh, emeritus uh, member of ASPN, uh, Dr. Marshall Better, is going to kick this program off about Boston Scientific and the personalization in pain management and how they're expanding their treatment options for their patients. Um, Dr. Better, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I want to wish you a happy birthday as well, Tim. And I'm uh, so impressed by the job that both David and you are doing on making Aspen the premier provider of education uh, during these COVID times and in the future, no doubt about that. So I have been around in the field of neuromodulation for, I guess it's a while. Uh, my first implant was in 1985, a year after the commercialization of uh, spinal cord stimulation occurred. This was in Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, started the first uh, neuromodulation program at Oregon Health Sciences University and went on to be one of the founders of NANS. Very proud of that, along with seven other physicians just as I'm very proud to be involved with Aspen as well. And so I guess I've been around long enough to maybe figure it out by now. But uh, what is really exciting is we are able to make a difference for our patients, a sustainable, effective treatment that we didn't have in the past. Next, next slide, please. And uh, tonight you're gonna hear 
uh, focus on spinal cord stimulation. And you'll hear that from my good friends, Lou Rosso and Jennifer Lee. And Jennifer, I know from Washington State, she's at Kirkland at the Evergreen Health System, doing a great job there. And Lou has been in practice in Jupiter, Florida, and is a, a leading researcher as well. But Boston Scientific uh, is not just focused on spinal cord stimulation. They did acquire advanced bionics and made incredible uh, changes in technology and advances in technology that we'll talk about. But they also acquired Cosman, the leader in radio frequency, and more recently acquired the Vertiflex uh, portfolio, which is, as many of you know, a very dramatic, uh, breathtaking change for our patients. But what this really shows you is that you need the right treatment for the right patient. And that's what Boston Scientific is able to deliver. Uh, next slide, please. I want to just say a brief word, which you'll hear a lot more from and a lot of good clinical evidence from Jennifer. But Boston Scientific has made an enormous uh, investment in a digital ecosystem. And one of their endeavors that you'll hear about tonight, amongst others, is what's called My SCS. And what is My SCS is basically a, a patient driven um, modality, it is connected. And it allows me to be connected to my patient real time, which is very exciting. I look forward to getting my text and seeing the little happy faces on how they're doing with function. And the patient sets their goals for function. So you're going to hear a lot more about that. But that is the future. Next slide, please. Now, a unique approach that Boston Scientific has which no other company can really say they have, is simultaneous combination therapy. Not just pairing, not just intermittent uh, pairing of frequencies, but the ability to have fast onset, the traditional dorsal column system stimulation combined with dorsal home, dorsal horn, subperception. And that is overlaid together and both together produce incredible results that you will see. And you'll see hard evidence of this from Lou in just a bit. Next slide, please. The cornerstone of achieving the successes that we're seeing is this contour algorithm, which is proprietary algorithm that allows you to use subperception therapy spanning a large segment. So you're not just trolling up and down, you can find multiple sweet spots by basically having like a carpet over two vertebral segments. And, and that is a game changer and also allowing more efficient use of energy. Next slide. So with that brief introduction into the incredible technologies that are occurring, we're going to hear the clinical evidence from Dr. Rosso, who's been intimately involved in this, and I look forward to his presentation tonight, as I do to Jennifer's. Please take it away, Lou. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Louis Rosso. I've been in Jupiter, Florida, practicing for over 28 years now. And to me, over those uh, 20 years, my passion is always focused on outcomes. And so, as I've seen, as I've seen, you know, changes in spinal cord simulation, I've always gone to the to the out the outcomes. Are my outcomes improving? Are the systems better? Are they more user friendly? And am I able to relate to my patients and give them a better quality of life and functional improvement? Next slide, please. I mean, you can stay there with that side. I'm sorry. So, go back one slide, please. So today I'm really gonna talk about my journey to getting better outcomes with spinal cord stimulation therapy. Today we have advanced state-of-the-art spinal cord stimulation therapy that is simple, efficient, and effective to use. My clinical experience is based though also on solid evidence, and today I'm gonna to share some of that evidence with you. Next slide, please. So, you know, 
if you think about it, the, the Simon Thompson's Proco study, Simon out of the UK, everybody knows Simon, was very significant. Why was it significant? Well, first of all, he looked at the sweet spot. We were always told that the sweet spot was somewhere around the T9, T10 disk space, but he found that the T sweet spot could vary anywhere from T8 to T11. But also with the Proco study, he exposed those patients to 10K therapy, 7K therapy, 4K therapy, and 1K therapy. And he found that 1K therapy was just as effective in pain relief as the 10K therapy, but yet was, uh, so it was very uh, simple, but then we took it to the next level. Now the contour algorithm is what Marshall uh, basically introduced. Next slide, please. And what the contour algorithm really is, it's a sort of a putting green of two vertebral bodies of a sub-perception programming. And with the HALO study, he knew from PROCO that the sweet spot varied anywhere from T8 to T11, and that hate and that this contour algorithm would cover two vertebral bodies. So he wanted to target those sweet spots using the contour program. So he basically placed, placed those leads and then talked about pain relief with these patients over but covering those sweet spots. So he tried to do this in a, what's called a very simple manner. So this is the <coughs> simple portion of the, the therapy. But what HALO did even further is HALO took now patients that were exposed anywhere from 1K down to only uh, 10 hertz. So from 10 hertz to 1K. And he found that it was optimum at 200 hertz. So we use now the contour algorithm at 200 hertz in a very simple manner with targeting using the contour algorithm. Next slide, please. So what are some of our other challenges in the past? Well, it's energy efficiency. And from the HALO study, we know that from 10K uh, down to 1K, we used about one third less energy. But then if you lower that even further to uh, 200 hertz, it uses almost 90% less energy. So now we have a very simple program that is efficient as far as energy usage. Next slide, please. And then also from the HALO study, we saw uh, pain relief um, uh, with dramatic pain relief that was sustained. And even uh, Dr. Paz, a neurosurgeon out of Spain, presented four-year four, uh, four therapy with using the contour algorithm that was effective also with sustained pain relief at four years. Next slide. And then utilizing the combination therapy. And you know, Boston Scientific still is the only uh, system that is actually using combination therapy simultaneously. It's not cycling between one waveform and the other, it's using them exactly at the same time. So the combo therapy is, and, and the combo RCT, level one, level one data showed that patients were in the test uh, arm, they were exposed to both tonic stimulation and the contour algorithm, whereas the control was only with tonic stimulation. So what did they find with the uh, contour, with the combination therapy utilizing the contour algorithm? They found, first of all, with the ODI, the ODI decreased approximately 26 points. Anything greater than 11 points is clinically significant. That ODI, ODI decrease is actually better than a lot of some of the other major studies that were produced over the past few years. But also the patient satisfaction was at 90%. So now we found it was a simple programming utilizing the, the data from HALO. It was efficient, but it was also effective. Next slide, please. So I can tell you it's been a journey. You know, I've been doing spinal cord stimulation uh, since the 1990s. My first implant was in, in 1990 uh, with uh, Dr. John Carlo Barillat during training. And since that time, obviously technology has been great. And I can tell you in the last, you know, eight years, things have changed so much. We have so many options. 
but we really are concerned about our outcomes. And that's what I'm concerned about. I want to get the best outcomes for my patients. I want to be able to look them in the eye at the end of their trial and after the implant and know that they're happy with, with their therapy, they're more functional, with decreased pain and de decreased reliance on opioids. So once again, the Contour algorithm provides a simple, efficient, and effective pain release, and it's based on clinical evidence. Next slide, please. So now I want to introduce a good friend of mine, Jennifer Lee, out of Washington. She's done some wonderful work there. I've had the honor of teaching with her in the past. Uh, she uh, is really connected with her patients using the digital ecosystem, and she's going to explain that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lou, for the great introduction, and thank you, Aspen, for for uh, supporting this format for us all to share with one another and stay active, learn, stay actively learning during this COVID crisis. So, I spend a lot of time in my practice, a, a great deal of effort, working with my patients and trying to personalize their care, and a great deal of effort trying to engage them in their in their care plan as well. It's really been an, an important piece of my pain management practice. And I've been ex really excited by seeing the way Boston Scientific is starting to invest in technologies that align with these principles and really using this um, idea of a digital ecosystem um, to reach out and to optimize the patient simulator trial experience in, in every way that we can. So this is done, um, this, this slide here is a, a depiction of the new um, application MySCS. And so what this is, is a, a mobile phone application, which is a huge educational resource to the patient. So when I'm engaging in a, a discussion about a patient, with a patient about a, a stimulator trial, um, I can get this patient to become familiar with this application. Um, and when they leave my office, they will have um, access to, uh, to ongoing information, not um, being restricted to going online or talking to a friend or device representative after they leave. Um, and they are not asked to go um, you know, to, um, use a, a DVD instead. It's gonna be at their fingertips um, where on their phone. And then once a patient does commit and is um, engaging in plans for a, a, st a stimulator trial, it's the same application is used to frame the trial experience. So the application engages them in the um, philosophy of considering the way that they are looking to improve their life through spinal cord stimulation and improved pain relief. They'll set personalized goals. I've had patients of mine set goals such as wanting to walk to the mailbox and back without pain or wanting to be able to sit through their grandson's soccer game um, without discomfort. And then they track their progress through the course of the week um, trial. Um, the the, the uh, MySCS application sends them automated uh, reminders to consider and record how their pain relief is being affected by the stimulator therapy and also to look and consider um, the ways that their life is changing. So are they sleeping better? Are they less restricted um, from being physically active? The MySCS application becomes also really important to me at the end of the trial because there's a trial summary report that's printed out for me and I use it as um, a foundation for the discussion that I have with the patient at the end of the trial week. Um, I can see what they have recorded um, in their own words, as well as the scores um, that they, they have recorded, and we can see if their goals have been met. Um, it also is important in the event that um, I have um, to support authorization for implantation and denials. I can use that same uh, trial summary report, which I include in my medical record, um, and, and supply this to uh, insurance companies. So overall, I think you know what I'm seeing is that this my SCS mobile application is really a, a fantastic way to engage patients in the trial experience and to make it a very simple and efficient and super effective way of communicating with my patients to get the best results during that week. Can I see the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So I've been really impressed and I can honestly say I've been surprised that so many of my patients have been as excited as, as I have about this application. Um, even my patients that I would have expected to be the most um, the least technically savvy um, have have been taking advantage of this and have been giving me really positive feedback about it. And then those patients who cannot um, um, get involved or, or be independently managing the My SCS application have elected to have a caregiver help them out. And this is what I'm seeing in my in this. These same results are what I saw represented um, in the in the poster presentation, the uh, pilot cohort comparison study that was. Uh, shared at a poster presentation at NANS um, just in January of this year. So what we saw here was that there was two groups of patients. The first group of patients, the larger group um, with a, um, a number of over 1,200, they had a traditional spinal cord simulator trial experience. Um, communicating with the device representative for most of that trial and then meeting with the physician a week later to discuss it. And then the, the other cohort of patients here um, with a, just over 700, they were simply given the opportunity to use it. They were um, provided the application to be downloaded to their mobile device and allowed set free to see if they would actually interact with it. And what we found was that Similar to what I've seen, the great majority of patients did, and not just once, but patients accessed this uh, mobile application multiple times to take advantage of the education and also to kind of observe their progress in pain and function through that trial week. Next slide, please. Thank you. Additionally, the pilot study um, was able to demonstrate that the patient's involvement in goal setting and in actively reporting um, the, tri the experience, the relief of pain and improvement in function um, during that trial through the MySCS application, it translated to improved trial success. And we believe this is because the patients were actively engaged in their trial. They're thinking carefully about the ways that it's improving the, their function and they're, they're participating in their care. Um, what you can see here is that the group of patients that did use the MySC application, MySCS application, there was a 6% greater trial success rate. And 6% is a meaningful number to me. Um, what's even more meaningful is if you look at that upside down, that means that there's 40% fewer trial failures. Um, that's pretty impressive and that's, that's a great success in any pain practice. I'm just overall really excited to see Boston Scientific in my opinion, transforming neuromodulation um, from this therapy that is passively delivered to the patient to uh, a therapy which is engaging them in this digital ecosystem and leading patients to a higher level of engagement in pain management. I also am really excited by the way that this digital ecosystem is allowing physicians such as myself to partner with their patients um, and to really make my practice smoother and, um, and more robust. So I'm going to pass it back to um, my friend, Marshall Fetter, um, and let him complete this. That's great. You know, who would have thought engaging patients in their own care gives you better success? Uh, something that family practice has been doing a long time, and now we in the pain field are doing it as well. It's also about expanding our treatment options. And I think that uh, uh, we see that with the new technology, things are changing. I just wanted to quickly ask Lou, Tim, if I have a moment, uh, that tell me a little bit about some of the things you're using some techniques that were from the past, but with the new technology that we're talking about, with the superior algorithms, you're seeing some different results. Maybe you can share that with us tonight. Well, you know, a lot of times we have pains with multifocal pain, and sometimes it's very dermatomal specific. So in the past, I know Tim remembers when we used to use lateral stimulation in the past. But the problem with that is we only had tonic stimulation. So I just think we're seeing a huge advancement these days with the availability of subperceptions. No nerve root or uh, any nerve root would really like long-term tonic stimulation. So I think the subperception has really changed that. So a lot of my patients may have multifocal pain. They have, may have had a hip replacement. They have, and, but they may have back in opposite leg pain. How do we treat those? Well, with one device, I can place multiple leads 
and then cover the, cover the, those uh, specific dermal tonal areas. So Marshall, can I ask a follow-up question uh, on that? Because uh, we, we, we think you guys did a great job and, and I have a few questions for you. And, and Marshall, I'm gonna start with you on the first question and then uh, we have a few questions for uh, both Dr. Lee and Dr. Rosso. Uh, the question for you is, you know, we, you've been around for a long time. I think the first time I ever went to an implantable course, it was uh, when I was a fellow and you were teaching it. So <laughs> we, we've seen all these great studies come along. Um, do you think there's still a lot of work to be done uh, based on your 25, 30 year journey? Or do you think that we're getting to where it's gonna be just fine tuning what we have? What's your perception of that? It's a big global I, question, but you can answer it well. I believe we're gonna have greater and bigger things to come. We're not just gonna be doing incremental work here. Uh, I see some of the other talks coming tonight and the future is out there. It's not any one company. It's gonna be combinations and combination therapies and new waveforms and new delivery systems. This is a very exciting time to be in neuromodulation. And uh, I'm glad that you keep presenting the topics and advancing it because it's happening and I'm excited. I love that answer. Don, would you have a question? Yeah, my question was for Jennifer. I think yeah, that was a really wonderful presentation and how you really use that MySCS platform to get your patients more engaged in their care. What do you see for future applications of that, you know, to, to move beyond? Because it even look, you know, in the non-MySCS uh, arm of those 1,200 patients, they all did pretty well too, like 85% of them went on to permanent. How do we use technology like that to get the long-term outcomes that we want? And are you aware of Boston Scientific using that platform for, you know, their permanent implant patients uh, to, to track and keep them engaged? Uh, yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, so, uh, you know, Boston Scientific has a new relationship um, with IBM. And so I'm, we're all looking forward to seeing what they do with that relationship in terms of the way artificial intelligence can be um, can be really actualized in in neuromodulation. Um, I I was fortunate enough to be one of the principal investigators with the Combo study, and so I I see I I see a lot of methods through looking at that study um, and the way that we were communicating with patients um, in terms of how we could expand that communication and imp improve that communication through my SCS application my SCS application. Um, when we're doing complex programming involving not only um, alternating um, between paresthesia and non-paresthesia waveforms, but combination waveforms. The other thing that I would say is that uh, the MySCS application has saved a few of, of, of my trials um, because really quickly I can see the results occurring in real time. And so if I'm into a trial several days and a patient is not showing rapid improvement, then I have an opportunity to intervene there. Um, and, and so I, I would say those are kind of the ways that I see that evolving. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. Great I think that, that that's so, so uh, really where we're going. And I think it's the first waves of where we're going to be. And so I want to follow up with you on that in a few minutes, but I have a question for Lou first. Lou, you know, you and I have been together a long time and you did some great work uh, early on. You started doing X-Top. And XTOP, for those of you who don't know out there listening right now, was uh, a procedure done mostly by neurosurgeons to uh, really uh, it's an interspinous spacer method where the, the the muscle was taken down. And Dr. Russell was one of the first people doing that outside the neurosurgery space. And we found in the comparative study that didn't work as well as Vertiflex, which is much less invasive. And uh, today I, I had a Vertiflex case with my new partner, Dr. Engel, who was, was with me in the OR. So my question for you is this, where does Vertiflex fit into our practice? You know, How can we use that to both improve our outcomes, but how does it complement spinal cord stimulation? Because I think that there is room for both that's, things. That's a great question. And, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure you and Dawood have seen patients that in the past have had SCS, but then they develop some neurogenic claudication. And I just did a case the other day of uh, I put in an advanced bionic stimulator in 2004, upgraded the patient to Spectra and then Spectra WaveRider. He came back with neurogenic claudication. I, I put in the, the uh, Vertifex device, two levels, and, and he's just doing well. So. I think it's, you know, it's it's all about the pain generator. And there's one pain generator where I'm really going to think about a patient, you know, patient with prior surgery has neuropathic pain, classic neuropathic pain. I think they're a great candidate for spinal cord stimulation. But if they really have pain that goes away when they sit down, if they go to the supermarket, they lean on a shopping cart, 
Uh, you know, in, in Florida, we have a lot of golfers. I always say when you're walking up to the tee box, is it easier to walk up to the tee box or walk back down to the tee box? You know, when you go back to your golf cart, it's, it's that kind of that thing just by watching the patient walk. You know, we have patients, we have a, a, the cane club now. After we put a vertiplex in, we, we throw away the cane, we put it in, we collect them and uh, we have them outside the waiting room. So it really, it's just part of the jet, you know, you're finding the pain generator and then you go after the procedure that's best for that pain generator. You know, so whether it be yeah. neurogenic claudication or something with basically neuropathic, ridiculous type of pain after back surgery. I think your point's so important, and I know we have uh, around 500 people either live or going to watch this recording, and what you just said is so important, find the pain generator. And then some people, they have both a radicular generator, which stimulation can help, and they have a, a stenosis generator. So that, that's a phenomenal answer. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dalwood? And even with our job to not only identify the pain generator, but treat the worst pain first. I agree with that, too. Sometimes with the vertiplex first, and then later on, do a, do a trial because they, you've gotten rid of some part of the pain, but they may be left with some axial back pain and maybe it's a, it's, it's time to explore at least with a spinal cord stimulator trial. Totally yeah. agree. My final question, if you could go back to that previous slide, uh, I think it's Stephanie that's running the slide, is for Marshall. So yeah. you look at Boston Scientific, and this is more of just kind of a generalized comp uh, question about just industry. Sure. A company sure. like Boston that is starting to kind of almost develop a kind of a portfolio of pain therapies, yeah. and you look at an RF ablation system, a spinal cord stimulation system, a system that uh, treats uh, spinal stenosis, then you know now there's a lot of rage around <laughs> sacroiliac fusion. Do you think that there is inherent advantage when one company kind of brings all these product lines in together versus, you know, we're all pain docs and we can call each rep individually for whatever we need. Do you see that there's an advantage for a company like Boston Scientific, since we're in the think tank right now, for them to bring in all these therapies and kind of be like a one-stop shop? Is there a lot of, you know, um, synergy that can be combined to enhance all these therapies? Well, I think there is, especially when you look at research and development. And a company like Boston has the has the background, has the the uh, portfolio, the income to drive these. Whereas the smaller companies on their own can't really do a lot. And so m much of some of the giants in the field, let's say in the day, um, Medtronic, who has they have a vascular arm, they have a urology arm, they have they have it all. It, it allows uh, economy of, of scale. It also I think gives the practices. I think some benefit, maybe in, you know, availability, pricing, uh, also reps can cross cover. I think there's advantage there. And I think the future is going to be uh, the pain, pain divisions will become true pain divisions. No more just spinal cord or now they went to deep brain, right? But no, now you see it's going radio frequency, vertiflex, and we know what's out there. And I know that it'll come. For sure. So great, great answer, Marshall. I think that was wonderful. Jennifer, we're going to do the last thought of the session before we go on. You have any final thoughts uh, before we close and go on? Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one thing you mentioned that I thought was really important was this, yeah. you know, the virtual world. And do you, do you think that uh, eventually we'll be able to, to program any patient anywhere in the world by uh, having uh, their their device and our and and our device uh, in our office? You know, yeah, I mean, I think that um, that's, I don't think that's necessarily true, but I guess I shouldn't put it out of um, reach. I mean, I think that we will be able to learn more um, about the way that these devices are improving patients' function um, through the use of artificial intelligence and activity monitoring um, and um, being really uh, closely engaged with our patients through digital applications. And, you know, when we, we all are physicians, we all are searching for the holy grail of great um, specific evidence that is closest to the experience we're trying to apply it to. I don't see how you can do that any better than having a close communication with your patient. And so that's where I really think um, the digital ecosystem that Boston Scientific is putting um, the gas on in terms of the way that they're investing, I, I think it's the way to be. Great, great answer, everyone. Thank you so much for this wonderful Thanks, uh, segment. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Thank you for having us. Look forward to seeing you in Miami uh, next year, if uh, not sooner. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
So that brings us to our next session, Dalwood. Um, certainly, uh, you know, we, we have uh, three great colleagues and friends of mine, uh, Peter Statz, uh, who uh, also was at the first course I ever took as a fellow. He, in fact, Peter taught me to put my first lead in. Uh, incorrectly, I think I had to overcome that over the years, but Peter, I think I'm getting there. Sean Lee, I met as a fellow who, who uh, worked with uh, Peter, and then Mark Russo, who has been a, a friend and colleague of mine as a, he traveled to America and I traveled to Australia over the years. So with that, I'll have Dalwood introduce the session. Yeah, we're really excited about this session to kind of close out uh, close out spinal cord stimulation for Think Tank uh, virtual meeting this year. So Saluda uh, in Tim already did a great job of introducing really kind of giants in our field right now with Dr. Lee, Dr. Stats, and Dr. Russo. We'll be talking about closed looped SCS uh, and a uh, clue into the profound effect on the quality of life. Dr. Stats, take Thank it from you, here. Thank you, Noah. Appreciate it. So this is really uh, a wonderful wrap up to what has been just a wonderful two day session. Uh, you know, before this meeting, Aspen, uh, West Virginia was one of my favorite pain meetings because it allowed us to do just what the title says. Stop and think, stop and think about what you're doing, what's going on, where are we going with the field? And I hope to challenge you all a little tonight to stop and think about what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing with our therapy. Um, can I have the next, uh, with, with me tonight is Sean Lee, uh, the leader of the New Jersey Premier Pain Program, uh, took over for me, uh, and Mark Russo, president-elect of the INS, another just an absolute giant in the field. All of these guys, and the, frankly, the people that have come before throughout tonight have been great friends, great colleagues in the field. And what we're all looking for is understanding what we're doing, how can we do this and can we do it a little bit better? So tonight, next slide. Um, tonight, I'm going to start with talking about an investigational device for those of us in the United States. Um, and it's not yet approved by the FDA for marketing. In Europe, it does ha it has received its CE mark. But what we're, my goal for you tonight is not so much to do marketing and whatnot, but it's really to talk about science, talk about ideas, talk about things that we may not have thought about for a long time. Next slide. When I started, as Tim said, and he and I came out at the right, about the same time, I think I was a year ahead of him, but we both came out at about the same time. We thought about spinal cord stimulation and my first case was a two lead contact system. And we basically revised that with Dr. North who trained me uh, to revise that, to do in a four, four contact system and two fours and then an eight and then a 16 and 32. And our whole field got stuck in this mindset of let's see if we can miniaturize, let's see if we can make more contacts, let's see if we can change from constant current to constant voltage. And it was really very set on a certain paradigm. The 2000s and 10s to today have came up with ideas about waveforms. And I think the data has shown, which you've seen tonight, is that some of these waveforms have been advances over what we've been doing to date uh, with the traditional tonic stimulation. But we're taking us to the next step. I think what I've said is stop and think. Stop and think about why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, when you take a look at fields like cardiology, it took about 15 years before we were doing sensing technology that included that, that really took uh, what Earl Bakken did and really moved it to a whole nother generation forward. And spinal cord stimulation has progressed for 50 plus years without that use of sensing technology. And unfortunately, you know, as, as good as the data that we've seen come over the last, you know, uh, just a few days of, of what it could be, the truth is there's an unacceptably high failure rate and nobody knows why everybody's failing. People are failing too frequently with the various therapies that are out there. And that goes from Jason Pope's paper to Dupre to Van Boyden. They've all shown the same thing that there's an unacceptably high failure rate. And when you stop and ask the question why, it's loss of efficacy. So what are, what are we doing? Can I have the next slide, please? With traditional spinal cord stimulation, all the different waveforms, 
provide one-way transfer of information to the spinal cord. And unfortunately, the cord doesn't tell us what it's actually doing. With the old paresthesia, you got a little bit of a sense that, gee, you're stimulating because someone would tell you. But for the most part, we don't know what the cord is seeing. The new wave is going to be using, I think, one aspect is going to be st stimulating the spinal cord, measuring activation within the spinal cord, then having real-time uh, modulation of the electrical current and changing the frequent uh, the amplitudes up or down if you're getting too much or too little, and then continuously monitoring and mining this data. And that is done with what's called ECAPS. And so it's activation-based pro activation programming. So very early on, we can determine if we're actually stimulating the spinal cord by measuring a evoked compound action potential. Then up to 3 million times a day, we can change the amount of energy that is being delivered to the spinal cord and either decrease the amplitude increase the amplitude or decrease the amplitude if you're overstimulating or understimulating. And then we can mine this data in real time and over a long period of time uh, and measure what's going on in somebody's spine. And so if there's a failure, you'll know why now, potentially. Now, an ECAP is a evoked compound action potential. And this is the sum of the various electrophysiologic responses, and what you hear over and over again is the ECAP amplitude. And you'll be hearing this over the years to come. But that's from the sodium channel opening to the potassium channel opening is the ECAP amplitude. But it has this particular waveform. And this particular waveform is unique to various types of fibers. So we can figure out what we're stimulating, if we're stimulating the wrong fibers, how many fibers we're stimulating, and we can control that more continuous, uh, more actively. I kind of think about this as in the old days when we would give gentamicin for an infection, we would actually have to measure gentamicin levels to avoid creating toxicity. And the only way to do that was blood draws every six hours or something to that effect. Um, we know we, traditionally we don't measure activation in the cord at all. And I think some level of activation is going to be absolutely required. I'm sorry, some level of monitoring is going to be absolutely required in the future to optimize our results and particularly to help us figure out if we're failing or if we fail, why that is. Can I have the next slide, please? So when I talk about um, commercial system, all the commercial systems out there today are basically open loop systems. There's various types of frequencies that one can use, but they all have one way transmission of energy and you the, we can't tell um, how much uh, energy the cord is seeing. And so when you take a look at the middle column here, it says ECAP open loop. A study was done that they're going to hear about in a few minutes, which has continuous current, uh, current amplitude that is a fixed output. And when you drop down, you can see that the cord sees great variability in how much it's activating, sometimes being understimulated and sometimes being overstimulated. When you come over to the far right-hand column, it says ECAP closed loop stimulation. What you see is a very big difference here. Instead of the current being continuous, it goes up and it goes down depending uh, on what is being seen on that ECAP. And so the cord itself, which is on the bottom of that column there, it's got a consistent level of spinal cord activation. So in theory, this is a potentially paradigm shift in how we think about spinal cord stimulation. But I think moving forward, in answer to Tim's question earlier, are we gonna be making advances? Absolutely. And one of the advances is we are gonna be shooting darts at some place where we have a target and we can actually see what we're doing. Whereas historically, I don't think we've been able to do that as well as we would have liked. So next slide, please. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner in crime, Sean Lee uh, from Premier Pain Center, to talk about some of the early clinical trials and the results of the Evoke um, highlights. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's been such a privilege to work in next to you and, and, and sharing an office with you where you taught me so much about neuromodulation. And today, I'm, I'm honored to share the platform virtually with you. 
Um, and also, I want to thank uh, Tim and Dawood for their leadership through Aspen for allowing this to, to occur uh, virtually um, and bringing everyone together uh, in the spirit of Aspen. So today, I'm, I'm, it's my pleasure to go over some of the EVOKE study uh, that is the uh, pivotal study uh, that will uh, eventually get this uh, technology introduced to the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So the EVOKE study uh, was first presented by Tim at NANS before the world changed in, in January. Um, so I wanna go through some of the highlights of this study and why it's such an important study. Uh, first of all, I'm proud to say that this was uh, recently published in uh, the Lancet Neurology uh, Journal, uh, which has an impact factor of 30. Uh, just to put everything on the same perspective, uh, anesthesiology, uh, another well-respected journal in our field, has an impact factor of about five. Um, so this study was a multi-centered, parallel-arm, double-blinded study. Um, and to, to, to repeat, it's the first double-blind study uh, in the field of spinal cord stimulation. So physicians, um, investigators like myself, were completely blinded to which arm the patient uh, landed on. And blinding was, was maintained and planned to be maintained for 36 months. Overall, we looked at both back and leg pain which is a unique combination because we know uh, patients have very complex pain presentations. Uh, and these were not just simple uh, short-term acute reticulopathies. These, these are difficult pain patients uh, with long-term uh, pain pathologies. Uh, many of them had pain pathologies lasting greater than 11 years. Next slide. So, as part of the uh, study, uh, we, we monitored adverse events. There was no differences in the two arms of the study. Um, all the study uh, adverse events were all uh, study related and not they were not related to the stimulation or device. Uh, next slide. So of the results that was published at 12 months, um, nearly 90% of the patients achieved efficacy meaning they, they were able to obtain 50% or greater in pain relief. Uh, so that, that turns out to be about nine out of 10 patients who had closed loop technology uh, were considered responders um, and superior to open loop. Next slide. Going beyond just VAS scores, we wanted to look at some of the more important secondary outcomes. I think one of the themes that's coming out of this uh, set of conferences uh, yesterday, starting with, with Dr. Fishman talking about function. Uh, today, I think Marshall mentioned as well function. Um, I think function is, is really the future. Um, and we're looking at how uh, patients are uh, surviving and improving and re-engaging with life. So in terms of opiate reduction, as pain physicians, we all know that the opiate crisis and the opiate epidemic is certainly not ended um, while we were dealing with a pandemic. Uh, so in patients who were part of this study, Closed loop patients were able to reduce or eliminate their opioids 55% of the time. And that's very remarkable. Next, looking at the sleep uh, quality, uh, using, using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, patients were able to obtain additional 1.3 hours uh, between the closed loop as well as uh, comparing open loop. Uh, 1.3 hours is remarkable for all of us who uh, are, are are well known to what sleep deprivation is. Having an extra hour of sleep in your day can mean um, a much better quality of life and function. Uh, next, we looked at disability. Eight out of nine, ten, eight out of ten patients with closed loop reported uh, a jump from uh, moderate to severely disabled to minimally uh, disabled. So that's a much uh, improvement in their disability and allowing them to function better uh, throughout their daily routine. So next, we're gonna talk about another population. Next slide, please. So next, we're gonna talk about a very unique group of uh, responders, patients who had 80% or greater in overall pain relief. So we call these high responders. So why is it important to talk about high responders? Well, first off, 56% of the patients with closed loop in this study uh, gained greater than 80% in pain relief. The reason why this is such an important factor is that 80% uh, pain relief has been categorized as um, a remittance of pain. So we're actually hinting on the possibility of, dare I say it, curing chronic pain. Not just 
in terms of uh, having high response, these high responder groups were also associated with uh, unique differences or improvements in these secondary outcomes, uh, which we already talked about in terms of uh, quality of life, uh, which I'll talk about next. Uh, next slide, please. So in these secondary outcomes in these high responder group, uh, looking at disability index, uh, approximately 50% of the patients were able to go from uh, moderate to severely disabled to the next level up, which is minimally disabled, uh, which is a whole category in the OD, uh, ODI uh, scale. Next, in terms of sleep, uh, approximately 46% of the patients in the high responder group were able to normalize their sleep. I certainly can tell you that I'm not able to normalize my sleep so far with my schedule, but being able to sleep um, on an average uh, greater in terms of time and quality can definitely play a factor in overall uh, pain presentation. And lastly, I wanna introduce the topic of therapeutic window. Uh, Peter alluded to that earlier. Um, in terms of medications, we need to check uh, profs and, 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 and peaks to in order to make sure that patients are getting the right amount of medication. Well, just like in stimulation, we want to deliver the right amount of stimulation. We noted that patients who are in the closed loop group uh, were in the therapeutic window 70% of the time versus 60% of the time with open loop. So that's a, an improvement, and we're able to show that um, patients who remain in their therapeutic window uh, have better outcome. So uh, you can stimulate the cord all you want, but I think. Uh, the best way to put it is uh, power is really chaos when you can't control it. So in the words of my, my imaginary great uncle, Bruce, uh, you got to be like water um, and you be hard and soft at the same time, but you have to have control. So with that, um, I'm going to hand this off uh, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Russo from Down Under, who's going to talk about the Avalon study. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Dawood and um, Tim for scheduling this at this time, so I'm not giving this lecture at uh, three o'clock in the morning. So um, very pleased with that. Um, so next slide, please. So just before we uh, get into the details, this is a slide that usually comes at the end of, of a talk. And what I'd like to do is put it at the beginning, because I don't think you can really um, uh, get an understanding of the device if we don't address what uh, adverse events may be occurring. So in our study, in our Avalon study, which we've got two year data on, uh, what we had was no un unanticipated adverse device effects, uh, no events related to feedback um, that we weren't actually looking for. And we had three serious AEs, one was an allergic reaction to titanium in, in one of my patients. Uh, one was some um, discomfort with the anchors. Uh, so that was classified as a new low back pain. Uh, and one patient had a small partial wound dehiscence that was uh, treated conservatively. Other than that, there were the typical AEs that one would expect in the study, which was some uh, pocket pain um, and some temporary dysesthesia that uh, disappeared um, uh, over the uh, pocket uh, and a couple of patients who had some lead migration. So all that was consistent with what we know from the neuromodulation uh, literature. Next slide, please. So this is the very high level takeaway. I don't have a lot of time to, to uh, go through the nitty gritty of our two year study, but we know with the Evoke study, we saw you know nine out of 10 patients uh, responding in terms of a 50% or more pain reduction. And what is gratifying, I think, is that I can tell you in the Avalon study that was conducted here in Australia, we saw essentially the same figure. So that we see not only efficacy, but we see sustained response at two years. And I think to me, this is one of the most remarkable things, I guess, for both uh, us here in Australia and for yourselves in the United States, is that rarely has a product ever come to market in our field with two year outcome data. I mean, that didn't happen with Nevro when it made its, it, its big break. It hasn't happened with a number of other uh, devices or, or waveforms. But before you even start to implant, you know what the outcomes are for people two years down the line. That's fairly unique with, with Saluda. Uh, and I think it gives us a great degree of confidence in what we can expect to see 
in our patients. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at the actual pain relief, I've broken this down into both uh, um, uh, responders by that 50% or more pain relief. And then that subset that we're really looking for now, we're really looking to maximize, which is our high responders, which is starting to be characterized in the literature by 80% or more pain relief from, from baseline. And as opposed to what the typical studies have shown, which is a loss of efficacy over time, what we see is a maintenance in the responder group, maybe a small increase, uh, but in particularly the high responder group increased their responses over time. And this may be a cumulative effect of therapy. It may be that that amount of pain relief allows you to engage in significant physical therapy, which has its own benefits above and beyond stimulation. It may have been some improved programming that go, went into the device over time. I think time will tell uh, as to what the um, uh, causes are of this increase. But what we're seeing is no decrease. And I think that's the fundamental issue here that it is reassuring. Next slide, please. So in, the, in this study, uh, like many uh, initial studies that are foundational, we, we took the attitude that we would ask the patients to uh, self-reduce their opioid medication. So it was left in, in their own hands uh, to, to do that rather than being a physician mandated uh, process of reduction. So we're looking at the spontaneous rate, if you like, of opioid reduction. And what we see is a significant reduction, um, uh, in fact, a halving uh, of opioid um, mean equivalent dose in terms of morphine equivalents over the space of that period of time. We get a fairly dramatic reduction over 12 months and then stability after that. And I'm fairly confident that with aggressive physician reinforcement, we could push that figure down to an 80% reduction, getting that down to around you know, 20 to 25 milligram morphine equivalents. And I think we'll see a great change in quality of life when we do so. We'll see a reduction in the dysphoria that chronic opioids can cause in terms of the mood state. Uh, we'll see people with reduced side effects. So there'll be a lot of improvement I think to come combining an aggressive opioid reduction with what the device itself gives you for opioid reduction. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of disability, we saw uh, the reduction in the Evoke and what we see in the Avalon two-year data uh, in a different cohort is more or less the same thing. We started with very disabled patients, long-term chronic pain, these are the patients that sign up for, frankly, investigational studies. 80, over 80% 80 of them were severely disabled. But by the 24 month mark, there was a reduction to about 20% of patients being uh, categorized as, as significantly disabled. So we'd converted a whole lot of disability into ability. And that's gonna have consequences for cost effectiveness. That's gonna have a, a, a consequences for healthcare utilization and for quality of life. Next slide, please. This is a very interesting um, slide, and this was unexpected um, from, from the study. I guess we couldn't predict it in advance, uh, which was that when you're programming uh, the, the device and you're turning on the feedback loop, you want to track that loop, make small adjustments in programming so that your loop capture is optimal. And that takes about 30 days to stabilize out uh, for the software to optimally capture that and make some tweaks to it with programming. So, you know, three programming uh, sessions on average in the first month. But after that, as you can see, it is, it is literally set and forget. So the amount of programming required is minimal. Uh, you know, the, in, uh, the whole rest of it, there's, there's less than one a year in terms of actual reprogramming. And that is going to have uh, a lot of benefits for a reduction in the burden of patients visiting the physician, which is good for the patient, it's good for the physician. Um, and it will speak, I, to me, this speaks to the stability of the uh, device and the stability of the um, stimulation that is occurring. The patient's not having to fiddle upwards and downwards. The patient isn't experiencing um, overstimulation and pain that requires uh, uh, changing things. 
And presumably we're not seeing tolerance because if we were, the patient would be back for programming. So this is an indirect measure, if you like, of efficacy. And I think it supports the primary efficacy findings with this associated lack of uh, uh, programming requirement. So across a, a range of different uh, features, the two-year data uh, is supportive of the randomized controlled trial of the United States. And I think uh, already we've learned a lot uh, on how to optimize this for, for patients. And I think the, um, the untapped area, I don't have time to go into it, but the untapped area will be in uh, uh, assessing whatever failures that occur and looking at the neurophysiology of what we're seeing in the spinal cord and saying, how do we solve that for this individual? So perhaps moving away into a customized setting for an individual with aberrant uh, ECAP potentials, for example. So I think there's further optimization to come from the, from the device. And hopefully that'll stimulate uh, some uh, questions uh, during the discussion time. Uh, I think that may be it for me. I'll check the next slide, please. Yep, so back to Peter. Um, I'll go back onto mute and back to Peter from there. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, let's see. So thanks, Mark. Uh, really an outstanding presentation. And um, what I want to do in this next minute or so is just kind of wrap it, ball, wrap it all up and what does this mean for us in the field? Um, you asked the question earlier of um, Marshall uh, about, you know, what's happening in the future. And I think one of the things to do is for us to step and look back and say, we've been doing something in kind of the same way for the last 50 years. And yes, we've changed some aspects of things, but this is a first time that we're actually gonna have two-way communication. Long-term outcomes are gonna be really important. You know, when we start hearing about, okay, our, our perm to trial rate, our trial to perm ratio is this, that's, I don't think gonna be as important anymore. What's gonna be important is, are we sustaining long-term outcomes? And then finally, the, the, some of the clues that you saw tonight from the opioid issue and the other secondary outcomes is, these are patients in front of us. These are not patients with just a pain score. These are people who have difficulty sleeping, difficult time working. They have difficult functional capacities. They have different changes in their moods. And when we have a therapy that's really effective, I think that we're going to be uh, moving in a much more powerful direction uh, going forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to our fearless leaders and, and uh, thank Dawood and uh, Tim, and um, uh, happy to answer some questions for you. Well, Peter, that was a, a phenomenal presentation. I think we just have a, a moment left. So I, I, I'm going to ask uh, Mark a very brief question. Mark, the 24-month data of Avalon showed improvement compared to one year and uh, your overall outcomes. I've never, ever seen that before. What do you attribute that to? Um, I'm not certain. <laughs> Um, I think there was a small amount of iteration of the actual software programming and my gut feeling was a, a little bit of the second half may have been um, better for the patients, so that might have been incorporated into it, but also, also something fundamental happens when you eliminate 80 to 100% of somebody's pain. They, they return to the person they once were. We all know the pain persona. Right? We see it every day in the clinic. To see a person shed that pain persona and a new persona come up that you have never met before, it, it is phenomenal to see that. And that's a qualitative statement that everyone who's experienced knows, but is, is hard to capture. But that's what we saw with these patients. And, and I think that reflects the improvement over time as they return to exercise, they shed weight, they get rid of the opioids. Uh, very exciting. Darwin? Yeah, I was going to give the final question to Sean. So I think, you know, the science and the physiology when you talk about ECAPs and closed loop stimulation is really fascinating. I think we really have a, a treasure trove of data. And uh, I was not involved in any of the studies, but one of the things that are, really interests me is going beyond just looking at, you know, vast scores or objective data to optimize a patient. Do you see us in the future being able to use some of the data from the ECAP to manage our patients long term instead of just hey, what's your pain score today? Because sometimes if it took them 30 minutes to park instead of 15 minutes, they say it's a nine. 
Great question. I, I think that's going to not only lead us there, I think uh, we're going to be able to be better targeting in terms of how we even utilize neural stimulation because the ECAPS can actually determine how well a patient responds during a trial, uh, during therapy, and then long term. So I, I think the best way I can describe it is uh, the difference between uh, buying, buying a jacket off the rack that's measured to your size versus buying something that's tailored to you um, so you don't have to go back and have it altered, but having something uh, where now, you know, the, the high-tech military guys have these suits where it can adjust to you as you are running versus as it adjusts to you as you're holding still versus when you're crouching down. So having something that's adaptable and always uh, uh, tailored to you as you do any activity, uh, I think this is, you know, a, a uh, a, a new way of thinking. So I'm, I'm truly excited and um, grateful for this opportunity to, to, to showcase this technology and we'll be able to hopefully offer to our patients. So great, great answer, Sean. I need one of those suits. That sounds awesome. I'm gonna have to- no, This is off the rack. <laughs> Not that suit, the suit the military guys wear where we can change as we move. I need that thing. Uh, all three of you, thanks so much. It was a great presentation. Thanks, guys. And, um, great thanks, to see guys. you all through. Great job. Peace. Uh, Dalwood. The think tank, it's the last thing we have. Let's go yeah. over the think tank with one so of our this great is actually friends. Kind of what I've been, this is, I think, for me, the most exciting part of our, our, think, our think tank is our shark tank sessions. You know, we were originally supposed to be in the Bahamas, so the shark tank, you know, seemed a little bit more apt, but, you know, now you're sitting in West Virginia, I'm sitting in Kansas, there's no sharks around us. So the three sharks will be Chris, myself, and Tim, and we're going to have Dr. Sohn, who's really, you know, not only kind of a leading scientist and advocate in pain medicine, but he's really uh, innovator, entrepreneurial, uh, and has developed a lot of uh, really cool technologies. He's going to talk to us a little bit about his latest project. Dr. Sohn, would you care to you. Uh, enter the Shark Tank? Thank you, and I appreciate uh, setting this up, and I want to talk to you about artificial intelligence and machine learning to facilitate precision medicine in spinal disorders. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide, and one more. Next slide. Yeah, this is me right here, uh, Amol Soin. Um, and just by way of background, education-wise, I have five college degrees. Um, I went to two Ivy League schools, Dartmouth and Brown. I uh, did my pain fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm currently president-elect of ACIP, president of the Society of Interventional Pain Management Surgery Center, CEO of Ohio SIP, and I'm on two statewide boards by the governor, including the uh, State Medical Board of Ohio, where I served as its president. Next slide. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what Soy Neuroscience is. Who are we? We are a neuromodulation company. We have our own proprietary peripheral nerve, spinal cord stimulator, sacral nerve stimulator, and deep brain stimulator. But we're also a pharmacology startup. Uh, we have a drug called sodium nitrite that I recently out licensed. And we also have another patent, which is actually my first revenue generating patent on ICU myopathy that's had new life breathed into it because of COVID-19. We are based in Dayton, Ohio, new paragraph. I want to make the case to all the sharks about vertical integration of soy neuroscience. We can control all parts of the research and development product class. But most importantly, I want to pitch to the sharks and explain how we have capabilities beyond most centers on planet Earth and make the case that in fact, soy neuroscience is the best place in the United States for research and development of pain products. Next slide. And here's what I want to show you. This is our building uh, on campus at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. If you look at the top, it says Neuroscience Engineering Collaboration. This is a building that I was involved in creating. And what it is, it's a research laboratory that holds neuroscientists and engineers who are non-biology engineers to collaborate and work together and solve products, uh, solve, solve processes and develop products and intellectual property and hopefully startup companies. It was founded in three ways. One was by a $12 million research grant from the governor for job creation uh, for the state of Ohio and two donors. One was myself and the other was a gentleman named Mitch Adams for a total of a $35 million build out. Next slide. This is inside our lab as of last Thursday. You can see some of the labs are still open despite COVID-19. It's a beautiful facility, five stories, uh, 90,000 square feet. Uh, next slide. Um, this is my laboratory on the second floor where I do a lot of translational research uh, work is 10,000 square feet there. Next slide. You can see this is the inner part of my lab. The bottom right is actually a magazine article that we did to pitch our services to other companies. Next slide. 
that's called the Neuroengineering Collaboration Building, the NEC. We have over 30 research scientists on staff. We have our own auditorium that seats 100 people. We do meet and greets where the engineers pitch their products, neuroscientists pitch their ideas, and we try to collaborate and solve things together. We have a dedicated spinal cord lab. Uh, we do a lot of Department of Defense research because the Wright brothers actually invented the airplane here. So we have a very large Air Force base. Uh, we just recently run, won a large grant on battlefield pain management. I could talk about that for about an hour. We have our own patent CT scanner, and we also have an animal lab for basic animal research. So we can do basic animal research. We can do prototyping design with the engineers. And next slide, we can also do inhuman trials, uh, which I would argue unlike anyone else, because about a mile away as a crow flies is the Soin Medical Center. This is a freestanding hospital, $285 million project. We have over 500 staff physicians. We are a center of excellence for spine and pain. Obviously, it's very important to me. 24-7 pain management coverage. Uh, we have a residency program that we started about three years ago, and within three years, we will graduate 55 ACGME accredited residents. Kind of surreal, because when people apply for the match, apply at Sony Medical Center, and we'll get a diploma with my last name on it, which is kind of neat. Next slide. Here's the inside of Sony Medical Center on the top left, and on the bottom right, you can see another rendering of the hospital. Next slide. So we can control everything from animal research all the way up to inhuman trials. And we also have a grants and innovation center where we apply for research grants and we do clinical studies. And it's rather robust. I know a lot of pain doctors and a lot of people have their own research arms, but just by economy of scale, within the past two years, we've done 188 clinical trials, including trials for all the majors. And we've enrolled over 2000 patients in various studies. Next slide. So in neuroscience does a lot of R&D for pain management. We've started a lot of portfolio companies. I've done a lot of venture capital investing, only in the initial seed round. And we've been around for about 10 years or so, and we've already had a transactional value of exits for our startups over $1 billion. Uh, Neuros Medical that we all know of, it's a peripheral neuromodulation company. It's raised over $30 million in VC money. That money's been increased quite a bit this year. Thermalin developed a non-refrigerated um, insulin. It signed a $788 million deal with Sanofi to develop that product. I've also outlicensed uh, multiple medications. The um, sodium nitrite, the drug that I invented for diabetic peripheral neuropathy, I was the sole owner of the patent, and we actually outlicensed that to a drug development deal for $225 million. It's actually now owned by a publicly traded company on NASDAQ because it's traded in hands a couple of times. We recently, last month, just founded a new neuromodulation company to treat GI disorders, and then we've developed multiple AI platforms, which I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the time. Next slide. The AI started with a meet cute, and here's how it started. I went to school to pick up my son, and the guy in the locker next to my son, my son says, hey, this guy's dad's a neurosurgeon. And I turn around, I meet this new uh, neurosurgeon, and we talk for a little bit, and a week later, we're at a soccer game. Our kids are losing 12 to nothing, and they just got scored on. The neurosurgeon was sitting next to me, I'm eating a Subway sandwich, he's kind of upset, he looks at me and he goes, you know what, you know what I think? I think spinal cord stimulators are bullshit. And I could have said a lot to that sentence, right? I could have engaged him, I could have argued with him, but what's the point, right? And I said, you know what, you're right, they are sometimes, but so is spine surgery. But the real question is why is that, right? And then we started talking a little bit about it. And by the end of that soccer game, on the back of a subway napkin, we actually wrote out an algorithm on why we think that happens. Next slide. And the reason why I think it happens is we're selecting the wrong patient. The reason why we're selecting the wrong patient is because we're not looking at all the data that's available to us to make the right decision, or maybe we have some implicit bias. Implicit bias is everywhere. If you have foot pain and you see any faculty of Aspen, they're probably going to talk to you about DRG, right? Maybe that works. Maybe it's not the right choice. What if we had a way to take bias out of the equation? What if we had a way to mine every single data point that that patient has and track their outcomes and have a very large database? We could probably make very informed decisions. So we decided to try to create that database and use a machine learning algorithm to track outcomes. Next slide. So we have so far done 500 patients and we uh, took their charts and separated them into the following diagnosis categories that you see up there. Then we entered in a bunch of data points and we tracked their outcomes through therapies. Next slide. And we also developed an iPad app using a Google form that when patients now come into our clinics, they actually fill out this Google form iPad app. And that too is also um, generated in our database. And we've compiled 80 total unique data points that we think are very pertinent to decision-making and the algorithm of spinal care. Next slide. 
So here's some things from the Google form. You can just keep cl clicking next as we go through here, because you'll see some er arrows that show up. So just keep clicking next slide. But we have multiple different aspects of our Google form. Uh, and as the patient clicks through it, um, that you can see there's various indicators and there's very important things that we're trying to capture as we glean this data. So keep clicking next as you go through there. Uh, we use a lot of graphical interface with our iPad interface. And basically what we're trying to do is create an app uh, where we can anatomically determine their pain and try to figure out what's gonna work for them and what's not. Next slide. And next slide. Just some dermatomal mapping and that type of stuff. But basically what we wanted to do is take this data set and see if we can predictively analyze what's gonna be the appropriate next step and what would be the best next step and build a database. Because you've heard a lot of people talk today about data and why simulators work and why they don't work. Well, if we have this mountain of data, we can actually make informed decisions that are free from bias because we can have a machine actually uh, tabulate the data for us. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I went to Brown and it turns out one of my classmates from Brown is at Microsoft and works in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we hooked up with him when we were working on this project and he said, hey, why don't you use our platform called Azure? that Microsoft has, you can put all this data up in their cloud interface and we can actually spit out a meaningful machine learning intelligent algorithm that could be helpful for you. And that's what we're doing right now. Next slide. So right, as of right now, we have 500 patients in our database and we want to increase that to about 12,000 to actually get actionable intelligence that's meaningful. And we've actually created an app called Spinal App. Next slide. And the hope is that we can roll this app out to multiple different practices and you can actually use that um, in your waiting room to pre-populate your HPI, but also give you an informed decision on what the most appropriate diagnosis is and what potential treatment options are. But here's something amazing, because I showed you how Soy Neuroscience over 10 years has signed deals with over a billion dollars in exits. This project here, 10 months from writing on the back of the napkin to actually doing initial patients, we actually had an acquisition offer. Uh, we had an acquisition offer from a company called Mariner, which is a Microsoft Gold partner that my uh, friend from Brown put us in touch with, and they've actually offered to acquire the entire company. And that just shows you how valuable and how hot this space is. People really want artificial intelligence. Software companies want it. It's why Apple, Google, and Facebook are worth over $4 trillion combined. And it is truly the future of medicine that we're going to see here. It can be rapidly integrated into practices. There's minimal FDA hurdles to actually launch an AI intelligent platform system. And everyone's going to want it. Because if you're Medtronic, for example, and you have a database of several thousand or 100,000 uh, patients in there, you can actually use that data. You can identify, okay, which patient needs to use our fusion hardware, which patient needs to use our spinal cord simulators, and they would more likely, hopefully, have better outcomes from those things. You can have better trial to perm ratio and better outcomes and better health economics. And it's also a story of collaboration because when that guy told me spinal cord simulators are bullshit, the whole conversation could have ended and look what happened. Not only did I make a really good friend, someone I literally text and talk to almost every other day, we built a company together that's now very valuable for everyone. Next slide. Um, and, and next slide, this is, I did talk about the conclusion already. Um, we will be presenting this data at the ASAP annual meeting. It actually won one of the top abstracts uh, and also the same data won abstract of the year at our Ohio SIP meeting as well. It's over Labor Day weekend. Please consider coming. It's a virtual meeting. ASIP is one of the best organizations at advocacy and it's very important that we support it. Next slide. This is our poster that you'll be seeing uh, at ASIP. Next slide. And here's what I want to talk about here, and, and I want you guys to focus on this picture here. First of all, thank you to Aspen. Dr. Chakravati and Dr. Syed, what you've built in the past year is phenomenal. Hall of Fame worthy at the way you've branded and built Aspen. Uh, these webinars have been informative and helpful. And the last thing I want to talk about is the story of Dr. Deere uh, and a personal story of mine. In 2007, when I was finishing fellowship, I decided to um, go to NAMS for the first time. I was six, less than six months out of fellowship. And I was trying to uh, pitch one of my uh, portfolio companies, which is a startup neuromodulation company. I was trying to raise capital and raise awareness. And I tried to cold call and talk to everyone, multiple physicians, multiple people, and very few people responded and very few people wanted to talk to me, which I understand because nobody knew who I was. And the ones that did talk to me kind of patronized me and patted me on the back and said, good luck, but they really didn't think it was gonna go anywhere, except for two people. One was Mike Onischek, who was the president of neuromodulation at Boston Scientific, and the second was Dr. Deere. And that day, Dr. Deere gave me two gifts that I'm internally grateful for. One, Dr. Deere gave me the gift of his time, which I know is very valuable. But two, and most importantly, and something that I'll be grateful to until the day I die, is that Dr. Deere gave me confidence in myself. 
and look at this slide, okay? Because in 2007, when nobody wanted to talk to me, I think when they looked at me, they saw a kitten, right? But when I looked at myself in the mirror, I did not see a kitten. I saw a lion. And shark, it's all about mindset. Thank you. Love it. Oh, good job. That was phenomenal. So, 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 Emil, uh, that was very, very, very sweet of you, and certainly I'm so impressed with what you've done. Um, I think your idea, and, and you know, Dr. Chokabarthi is much tougher than I am, but I, I think your idea for this uh, um, artificial learning, uh, uh, you know, computer learning is is so needed and so amazing. And, and if I was uh, going to invest in a project, I think that would be one I would go all in. I, I think it's uh, the future. I think you're you're very uh, innovative in, in your thought processes, and I think it is the future. And I think we we need to get to hundred thousand patients. You know, um, you know, you do, you're off to a great start, but I think we could combine as a society, and I don't mean Aspen. I mean as a society of pain uh, physicians, and join you, and get all of our data together, and we could really decide. Because one of the questions I've always had, I'll say this and give it to my colleagues. I've always had the question: Wouldn't it be great? If we could just predict who would do well with which device, when you hear four different companies present on their data, if we knew a way to say, okay, based on your personal experience, this is the best device for you. That would be the future, and I think you're setting the future. So I'm 100% in uh, personally on your on your idea. So gentlemen. Thank you. Um, sure, I, 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 can, um, I can jump in. So, you know, I'm old, like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Imodian. It got actually bought out by Apple. Interestingly, it was a company founded at UCSD looking at um, iPhone and facial recognition with AI that end up now on all of the camera iPhones that you look at today. They all the ad service and how much of the AI integration happens. So I think this is awesome. I think it's really the future. I, I think cross society, cross data, there's been a, so much push on trying to do automation. So uh, I, I think you've tapped onto something. I'm really impressed. I mean, um, and the story with Dr. Deer, probably everybody will share that because he's that kind of person. So um, I'm really, I'm really congratulate you on all your success. That's really exciting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, you know, you're, you're one of the most impressive people in our field uh, with all the things you've done. And, you know, I, I'm really just impressed at the multiple tiered approach, you know, that you guys are doing there uh, in Ohio. Um, and, you know, this is not really a, a true chart tank, but more of a showcase of what you've kind of built. And, you know, we're really proud of you. And I think this, uh, you know, this AI, you know, initiative that you're going to launch has uh, undoubtedly uh, going to be very important for us. Uh, everything you've touched so far has turned to gold, and I have no doubt that this will. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Keep it, keep, appreciate keep the it up. platform. Yeah. yeah, keep it up. That's a, it's amazing. So I'm really proud of you, man. Keep it up. So next, uh, we're going to pivot a bit, and we're going to have uh, a, a, a really energetic young scientist uh, based out of California, Shiv, who I've gotten to know very well over the last year or so. Uh, and he's we've been talking about his new therapy, and he's really, uh, I think making a huge impact in the way that pain therapy can potentially be uh, provided. So Shiv is going to describe to us the, the Neuralace medical axon therapy by Neuralace, a novel, non-invasive, and sustainable therapy. Shiv? Thanks, Dr. Saeed. Care to, care to enter the tank? Sorry, go ahead. I said, you care to enter the tank, please? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this opportunity. And um, Super excited to be here. So yes, I'm Shiv Shukla, CEO of Neuralace Medical. I've started working on this technology 10 years ago. And so we're, we're still investigational about six months away from FDA clearance. Um, and so this is a marketing, marketing presentation, but what I'd like to talk to you guys about today is um, Axon Therapy, which is a non-invasive platform that we've uh, cultivated over the past few years at Neuralace, which is a three-year-old company to manage post-traumatic, post-surgical, chronic neuropathic pain. Next slide. So, uh, it's weird. Um, there's a little error on the slide here, but uh, 10 years ago, I was exposed to patients that were considered problem patients at UCSD uh, after I got into med school here. And I was doing research on patients that were considered refractory to all available solutions that you see on this treatment continuum from off-label medications and opioids 
to nerve block injections, nerve ablation, and spinal cord st uh, stimulation. Like uh, Dr. Stad said, you know, there's the failure rates are still pretty high, but back then they were even higher. And so I was focused on creating a therapy for patients uh, with chronic nerve pain that had no available options, no solutions, and completely refractory. Next slide. So introducing axon therapy. Axon therapy is a clinic-based procedure that provides targeted magnetic pulses that specifically activate A-beta. And so just to give some brief background here, I was working with Dr. Linda Sorkin and Tony Yach at UCSD, and I faced the challenge of, I was trying to activate peripheral A-beta fibers with electrical stimulation and learn that current travels through the path of least resistance, so it's really hard to control electricity in a conductor. And so, while using a magnetic simulation technology to help uh, TBI patients with their headaches, I was wondering if we could apply that, which works for cortical lesions, to peripheral lesions. Uh, three months later, after a lot of hardware and software modifications, we're able to test our therapy on a patient who I met um, very early in our process who had a shrapnel-induced uh, neuropathic pain in his calf. Two weeks after I met him, he took a shock into his leg. And so that was my first real experience of understanding how you know, harsh the reality is for these patients that don't have an effective solution. Um, doing mechanistic work on him and patients like him at the VA here in San Diego, we discovered axon therapy. So by providing targeted non-invasive pulses at the at proxim, uh, proximate to the, uh, le the peripheral lesion, we're able to activate A-beta and patients experience immediate pain relief. And so this is something that I haven't experienced before um, in terms of a sustainable solution. And we're, we're continuously working on Im improving our therapy by applying a more uh, effective means of delivering the therapy through a robotic system, which you see working on the left over here, and, and what um, some of the other physicians have spoke about, closed-loop feedback. So Neuralace is a bridge between technology and neurology, and we're very focused on non-invasively doing what I believe our current solutions are trying to do invasively. Um, for the patients that, you know, may not need such an invasive procedure. Next slide. So our luminaries and KOLs like Dr. Leo Caporal, Dr. Dayu Said, and Dr. Matthew Shockett believe that axon therapy has the potential to be a first-in-line treatment for these patients. And we're excited to continue to explore the opportunity. Next slide. So when we talk about nerve pain, um, or peripheral nerve pain, these, these occur due to compression and transections. Various different types of accidents can lead to this type of injury. However, what we've learned is that by activating A-beta, we're able to close the gate to small pain fiber signals from entering and passing through the DRG into the spinal cord. And so our, our MOA is, is focused on gate theory, but we've also seen that we can make some progress for patients, not only with trauma-induced neuropathic pain, but also chemotherapy, induced neuralgia, um, diabetic neuropathy, CRPS, and fibromyalgia. And all of these indicate that, um, you know, the, the mecha underlying mechanism for many of these types of neuropathic conditions might be similar to help patients alleviate their pain. Next slide. So to, and, and I apologize about the, um, the little uh, overlap in uh, our text here, but I'd like to talk about our randomized controlled study um, initially uh, that we did on 20 patients with three treatments in one week. And so in, in the control group, uh, patients experienced 14% pain relief after three treatments, whereas in the axon group, which you can't read here, they had about 45% decrease in their VAS score. And then we continued to follow the patients up after uh, three weeks after the th uh, first three treatments, where the control group patients had 10% demonstrated effect, a decrease in pain, where an axon therapy patients had a 41% decrease in pain. And so at a net effect of about 31% after you know, four weeks from you know, the first treatment, I call this our light at the end of the tunnel study where we were able to you know, provide some sustained um, levels of pain relief for these patients. It took two years to do the study, um, but it gave us enough you know, evidence that you know, it's worth double clicking on this and in investing further. Uh, more importantly, uh, on the evoked pain side, patients had a 40% decrease in their VAS score, and the area of hypersensitivity had decreased by 80% even at month one. So these are some of the you know, quality of life improving key benefits that were very exciting to see that we did not expect at all. Next slide. 
So if we overlay the initial RCT data um, on 20 patients um, over the patients that we're seeing in the clinic today, we've seen over 80 patients with over three months of data on our actual protocol, which is three treatments in the first week, weekly treatments for the remainder of the first month, one treatment every two weeks, month two, and one treatment per month, month, month three and on. And, and, and from that point, patients will continue to have one, one treatment per month. Um, what's exciting is that we're able to demonstrate a greater than 50% decrease in pain for these patients. And so, you know, uh, from, the, from, the, from the first week, if we stop treatment, you'll notice that the pain starts going up for these patients. However, if we maintain the treatment, the patients are able to provide, uh, have you know, sustained pain relief, which, you know, was, was super exciting for us. And so we have enough data to go through the FDA with a 510K, um, and, and we're looking forward to doing more clinical studies, but our early data is very promising. Uh, next slide. So moving forward, we're going to be doing a 20, 120 patient um, axon therapy versus conventional medical management study with Dr. Leo Capral and Dr. David Said as our PIs. We're also doing an exciting study with Dr. Charles Argoff on our mechanism. Um, we, are, we have a published mechanistic study where we show axon therapy increasing conduction velocity in A-beta and decreasing it in C-fibers. And we're, we're going to be studying um, that uh, mechanism further by looking at carpal tunnel patients that have modern neuropathic injuries. And so I think that will be a great study um, and it will give us more insight into our mechanism. In terms of reimbursement, because we're a new procedure, it'll take us some time to go down the CPT3 and CPT1 pathway to get our new code. Um, but we're working on some creative solutions to get reimbursement uh, starting next year. Next slide. So as, as we know, just because we have a good therapy doesn't mean it's gonna become a widespread procedure. Um, the incentives have to align for the patient, the physicians, and the payers. Uh, for the patients, they experience something new, which is sustainable pain relief within the first 15 minutes. The treatments are accretive, so patients have about a 36% decrease per treatment. That's why we combine multiple in the first week and then um, transition them to a more extended kind of treatment protocol uh, to once, once every four to six weeks. Uh, the, the therapy is non-invasive and it only takes 15 minutes per nerve with no significant side effects. In the beginning, we would overstimulate patients because we kept the amplitude the same. However, we learned over time the patients become more sensitized to the therapy, which is actually a good thing. And so we built in a, uh, in our algorithm how to decrease the amplitude. Um, and more importantly, for patients that have been on our therapy, for example, um, for the last two years, for uh, one of our patients who's a Stanford-educated ER physician, couldn't get out of bed, um, and two years later now is running their clinic in here in San Diego uh, with axon therapy. So the results are really exciting, especially when patients get off of morphine or Vicodin. Um, and in our next uh, 120 patient study, we'll be also measuring the opioid sparing effect um, uh, along with other quality of life factors. And uh, one of the most exciting is we're gonna be working with Dr. Michael Yang from Miami. They have a cool technology that uses cell phone data and history um, to objectively measure functional improvements. Um, and, and it's really cool at looking at their data from uh, their patients, you can actually see a decrease in activity even due to COVID. Um, so we're excited to implement that technology to get more objective data. Um, on, the, on the physician side, I think physicians are now gonna be able to provide immediate relief for patients that have refractory, you know, are, are considered refractory and you know, nothing's worked for them, which also expands their, their treatable patient population without cannibalizing the, on the current patients um, and provides a way to pr get recurring revenue through long-term results. And on the pair side, we can save an order of magnitude on the costs on therapies that are ineffective um, by utilizing a first-line therapy that's a low-risk option. Uh, next slide, please. So just to summarize where we are as a company, uh, we have a patented therapy with multiple pending patents, CMARC device, and we're about six months from FDA 510K clearance. Next slide. I'm going to market what we're excited to provide is axon therapy as a service that's plug and play for the clinicians that we work with, um, where we provide a, a trained op operator. We're going to rent our hardware and, and drive about 10 patients a month to the clinic um, and do a revenue split. So. Um, we'll, we'll, we can dive into the details um, further, uh, but high level, we're excited to bring a low barrier to entry option to clinics that are seeing you know, six to 12,000 patients initially, um, and we'll be launching into those as uh, flagship clinics. Next slide. 
Uh, here, here's an example of what our device might look like um, over the next few years in the clinics. Next slide. And we're going to be launching into private pain clinics, ASCs, and, and the VAs. And so year one, what that looks like is about 12 um, ASCs and about 10 VAs. So we're excited to you know, launch next year after 10 years of developing this technology. And hopefully, we can make it to one of your clinics in the near future. Next slide. So I'll create room for some questions now. Great job. Hey, Shiv, you know, we've, we've talked about your technology for a while, and I'm really excited to kind of get some more data and working with Leo and creating your study. You know, interventional pain physicians, you know, we fancy ourselves as, by definition, interventionalists. And I've kind of asked you this question before. Who do you really think for your therapy, who is going to be your customer beyond the patient? You know, which type of physician is really going to kind of gravitate towards this uh, in your estimation? Well, well, what's interesting is uh, um, from the sort of physician perspective, um, we, we're actually going to provide like a physical therapist tra um, trained operator to do the therapy. So while we need to be on site where there's an MD, we don't actually need the MD to do the therapies. And so there's the opportunity for non-physician driven kind of EBITDA and therapy here. But what we feel in terms of launching, um, the clinics that we want to target are the clinics that are seeing, you know, six to 12,000 patients have at least 2.6 million in revenue, 500K in EBITDA, because that's where our numbers are very exciting and there's more um, tolerance for you know a new procedure and investing in something like this. Shiv, let me ask you a question. So, so I, this is a, I think a really fascinating concept, and I think non-invasive therapies. You mentioned Charles Argoff. Charles is a leader in that area, so I think uh, you know that's really exciting. You've got some great interventionalists in uh, Dr. Shock, Dr. Capro, and Dr. Said. But my question is, I, I want to make sure I understand this. So, we would buy a table-looking device that is a reusable probe. That probe, it's a 15-minute treatment or so, yeah, every day for a week, and then every four to six weeks. And there's a there's and the the business part of that would be there would be a fee for the actual use of the therapy on the patient that would be uh, used through the insurer. Is is that the concept? Correct. Yeah, and and okay. there least does the revenue split on on that fee. Very good. Very good. Yeah, it's a new concept. It certainly would be very interesting. I think there's a lot of folks now doing transcranial. And so, you know, it's very similar to that. And I think that'll be the model to look at. So uh, if it works, it'll be very good in the treatment algorithm. And my other question for you is, where is it in the treatment algorithm? You mentioned people responded to nothing. So that would mean at the end of the treatment algorithm. But then what about the person who's just recently injured? Where does this fall in the algorithm? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we look at patients that are, you know, three months post-trauma when they're, you know, defined as being in a chronic state. But, um, you know, a lot of our conversations with our current KOLs um, go around, you know, like if we start earlier in the acute phase, maybe we can decrease the amplitude of their pain um, when it does get into the chronic phase or maybe even avoid it altogether. So, so maybe, be pre maybe be preemptively for chronic pain, you're hoping. Yeah, I mean, there's so much room for opportunity for improvement for us in terms of, you know, dose optimization. And then, especially with our closed loop feedback system, I think we'll be able to really accelerate, you know, our, our therapy and like personalize it to the patient's circumstances. And I think that's when you can transition to more acute um, um, type treatment options to provide, you know, relief while they're healing, for example, uh, post procedure. Fascinating. Dr. Chakravarti, any uh, final thoughts before we wrap up? I think it's very fascinating. Just to have a fun final thing, because usually the shark tanks end with everyone making a bid on how much they're going to put into this company. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, ask my fellow colleagues here, um, how much do you think, you know, actually, Shiv, you never mentioned a use of proceeds. So, you know, if we had an open checkbook here between the three sharks, how much would you be asking for? And then I'll ask my uh, fellow uh, shark folks how much they would be putting in and what they think this is worth, just for fun. Yeah, I mean, we're, we've raised the five and a half so far and about to raise 12 million in October for commercial launch. And so, you know, whatever's uh, reasonable and uh, exciting for, for, each, for each individual. All we're right, open so to it now. <laughs> we'll start with Dr. Sayed, because clearly he's involved. So I expect him to, um, would you invest in this? 
I, I think this has a lot of great promise. You know, I think uh, like Mr. Wonderful, I'd be looking for a licensing deal. Um, but I, I, out of in all serious, serious, I think you know it's really going to depend on what the data and the evidence shows. So that's why you know we've gotten involved in and in designing. I think with Dr. under Dr. Caprol's leadership, a really robust clinical protocol. Um, and we will see. You know, I think the initial. We know that it's a huge problem. Chronic pain is there. We know that some of the therapies we do are just too invasive for a lot of our patients. And if we can provide something that's non-invasive and effective, I think you know it's it's a huge market. So um, I think they sit they sit very well positioned pending uh, the the results of that publication and that data. Tim. So, so you know, Shiv, uh, you know, I think you're in California, right? That's where you are. San Diego. Yeah, that's where I thought. So I'm in West Virginia. So we have a saying here that goes, you know, bless your heart. And bless your heart means, uh, I, I think that you have great potential, but, but that would kind of stole my thought. You know, I think your study is going to be everything. Right. You know, no, no pressure on you. But if your study goes really well, then I can see this being like we have PT in our practice. We have some amazing physical therapists. I can see implementing this in our practice tomorrow if you have great data. Right. And so I would invest heavily, uh, Chris, if that were the, the case. If your study doesn't show great data, then I think you're doomed to fail after 10 years. So I think that I think all the money investment here will come down to the quality of your study. And I love the investigators you have, the quality of your idea, and you seem to have amazing scientifically based idea. And lastly, what the data looks like. And that's an initial investment. Now the long-term investment will be can that be reproduced by others. That's the real world experience, right? So so I, I so Chris, I would I would have some money in reserve. Uh, if I was an investor, waiting to see the data. And then I'd want a meeting with uh, Shev immediately after the study results were made public <laughs> and make a decision. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm in San Diego, so clearly West Virginia is in the other side of the country. So come to me first uh, before you go to the other. <laughs> but I, I'm, I feel the same way. I mean, I think it's gotten so as a crowded space. I know Tony's done a lot of stuff with Linda on this topic, and I think it's really yeah. cool, cool concept. Um, but I, I'm I'm with uh, I'm with the other guys too. I think um, good data is going to speak a lot to market entry. So great job, really. Great uh, job, man. Very yeah, nice. yeah, thank you all for this opportunity. Yeah. So, thank you. Chris, uh, you want to wrap up the the Shark Tank tonight with a few thoughts before Dawood and I close? Uh, sure. I mean, I I think. Um, you know, it's, this think tank is going. I mean, you see a lot of the fantastic presentations. We saw Amol and um, Shiv present some really cool stuff with AI and uh, some of the purple nerve stuff. And I think uh, we've got a couple more weeks of interesting companies that are going forward. Um, I would really encourage everybody that's watching to get um, as much information for an annual conference. I think Dawood's going to talk about that. Um, that's coming up in at September 18th to 20th. But uh, it's always amazing to see new companies, new innovations. I know I'm really passionate about this. It's, um, you know, all you guys serve as mentors and seeing all this get into patients is the end goal of it. So, and that's, that's been your career, Tim, I think. And I think you can speak to that over 20 plus years, right? So I no, think it's a lot, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun, Chris, to watch, uh, these new ideas and some of them make it and some of them don't. And, uh, I think that's why, you know, we should always ask for the data because if there's not data, then right. we can't say it and, and it has to be reproduced. I think sometimes when companies get FDA approval without data, it hurts them. You really like to have to do a study to get the approval. And I think that's really important. And then people say, well, the study was, was company-based. Well, of course it is. Uh, IDE has to be based by the company, but then that, can it be reproduced? So, so tonight's been amazing. Uh, remember, uh, Dalvik's going to close talking about our annual meeting, which will be CME uh, um, approved and with credits. And it's going to be a whole new platform. So Dalvik, do you want to talk about that a little bit before we close? Yeah, we're really excited to to launch, you know, a unique event. You know, we're equally, you know, disappointed that we weren't able to do our in-person uh, annual meeting in Miami, but I think this is really the next best thing. Uh, this will be uh, much more than just a, a webinar or a Zoom meeting. We really have uh, engaged a really innovative uh, vendor and platform called Red Story that's going to, you know, produce a meeting that I think it's going to feel like for people that attend it, that they're actually there. You know, we're going to have a lot of uh, concurrent sessions running. We're going to have plenty of opportunities for networking in a very unique way. Uh, and then we're going to be, you know, uh, not just uh, 12 people on a screen. Tim and I will be will be broadcasting live from Nashville, Tennessee, with the rest of our key opinion leaders in the space uh, kind of coming in and out. And the format will stay the same. You know, the spirit of what Tim kind of created with West Virginia 
SIP meetings. It's going to be an open panel discussion. So it's not going to be death by PowerPoint. It's going to be lively discussion. That's going to be CME, CME accredited and vetted. So I think it's still going to be a very unique and uh, one of the kind of marquee events in our in our space for the year. So we we encourage everyone to kind of you know take the day off all day Friday, log in Saturday and Sunday, you know, it's the weekend. So we hope everyone can still join us. And tomorrow um, we have a little bit of an update. We're starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So about an hour later than we started the last few days. Um, we'll be starting with uh, our targeted drug delivery uh, panel and then ending with minimally uh, invasive SI fusion. So we encourage everyone to attend. It's gonna be great. All right. And session four again will be on peripheral nerve stimulation and RF ablation. And then our last slide, session five, will be minimally invasive spine. So still a lot of great sessions to come. Uh, hope that everyone uh, continues to log on as they have been tremendous so far for the first two days. We've been very pleased with the attendance. Very good, Darwin. Everyone have a good night. And good night, everyone. Good night, all.